Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first thematic section of this conference on the legacy of Robert Wilson. The title of the section is Wilson's Post-Dramatic Stagings of Classical and Biographical Sources. Uh, and I'm very intrigued by this title because um, Frank Henschke and myself were students of Hans Dies Lehmann, uh, who is the person who coined the term post-dramatic theater. Uh, our first speaker this afternoon <laughs> is, of course, Antal Bokai. And basically, I'm just kind of uh, reiterating what you can already read on the slide because of the, uh, the fact that we kind of need to record this. So Antal Boka is Professor Emeritus of Modern Literature and Literary Theory and co-founder and lecturer of the Psychoanalyst PhD program at the University of Pech, Hungary. His research interests include contemporary literary theory, American deconstruction, modern poetry, poetics, theater theory, and the history and theory of psychoanalysis. Sorry that I'm so kind of nervous this afternoon. Um, and I have to say, so all of the talks this afternoon will run for 20 minutes plus 10 minutes Q&A. And I really kind of would like uh, all presenters to stay within the 20 minute time frame. Okay, enjoy uh, this uh, thematic section this afternoon. Thank you very much for the introduction. I really try to stay on inside the 20. However, I probably won't be able to tell the whole lecture in this time frame, but anyway. So, uh, one minute. Um, it, later it will, will uh, be clear what this picture is. The, my, this is my title. I would like to understand uh, the uh, Wilson play from the point of view of Sophocles and how Sophocles was uh, uh, used by Wilson and how Freud is in the background of this use of, uh, of Sophocles from Wilson. The play uh, King Oedipus was first staged in July 2018 at Teatro Mundi of Pompeii. A little later, it came to the uh, early Baroque theater of Teatro Olimpico Vicenza. I will show some pictures over this. In 2019, it was shown in the Epidaurus Festival, closest to the original birthplace. And I saw, I was lucky to see, quite accidentally, in Budapest in 2021. Uh, the first question I would like to understand, uh, Wilson never um, said that he put uh, Sophocles' play on the stage, but he said that Oedipus based on Sophocles' Rex. It's very important because the two are very different. Why Oedipus Rex? That's my first question. Um, I think that the significance of Sophocles lies in the fact that 2,500 years ago, he, Sophocles, articulated in dramatic form how desires can be integrated into life process. The drama is a kind of arche écriture. In a psychoanalytic perspective, the drama shows how the instinctive dynamics of desires of the unconscious allow and prohibit the individual to create his or her life destiny. This allow and prohibit is very important in case of Oedipus. Oedipus Rex presents an ancient but ever valid conflicting narrative of the birth of the ego. You see, I use psychoanalysis in these things. Um, it is impossible how, uh, it was impossible for Wilson and probably it's impossible for us to read the King Oedipus of Sophocles without Freud's powerful interpretation of the play. So we can forget, in a sense, uh, Freud's interpretation, the Oedipus complex in psychoanalysis. Freud, in a letter sent to his friend in 1897, so in very early, to Wilhelm Fliss said, first he introduced the uh, situation that his self-analysis is in fact the most essential thing I have at present and promises to become the greatest value to me if it reaches uh, its end. Uh, self-analysis was the projection or creation of psychoanalysis as it later became uh, uh, science and therapy. And uh, 
Freud uh, continues, a single idea of general worry, worry dawned on me. I have found, in my own case too, uh, the phenomenon of being in love with my mother and jealous of my father, and I now consider it a universal event of early childhood. If this is so, we can understand the gripping power of Oedipus Rex in spite of all the objections that, raises, uh, that reason raises against the presupposition of fate. The Greek legend sizes upon a compulsion which everybody, everyone recognizes because he senses its existence within himself. Everyone, you and me as well, uh, in the audience was once a budding Oedipus in fantasy and each recoils in horror from the dream fulfillment here transplanted into reality. His conscience is his unconscious sense of guilt. So Freud took Sophocles' play and uh, sat in the audience of the play and reacted to it. Uh, free associations came up in connection in his self-analysis and discovered in his childhood the Oedipal story in his own special private theater situation. Uh, the same happens in psychoanalytic therapy. Uh, the two-person theatrical narrative in which both the analyst and an analyzant discover or even create their respect respective Oedipus past history. I believe that Robert Wilson did the same as Freud uh, in his self-analysis Instead of repeating Sophocles' dramatic text in the theater, he put his own free associations uh, connected to the Oedipal story on stage. In a brilliant act, Wilson's Oedipus draws Sophocles' drama into self-analytic therapeutic discourse. We are enchanted by this 21st century theatrical case study that also unavoidably initiates and enforces our own self-analysis. What is the structure of the uh, text? I forgot to show the next. Uh, um, four discursive planes are present in the play. This is uh, not such in the case of Wilson's earlier planes. Uh, the body movement, the dance is very important in it the music, the text, and the images, and the stage vision. These four levels come parallel with each other and sometimes connected, but most of the times they do not connect to each other. The, vi the, the visual plane precedes the speech. Uh, uh, the beginning and the end of the play are visual dance performances without speech, a series of visual associations. The visual events of the stage are not connected to the themes of the parallel spoken text. Only very rarely, for a flash of time, is there a connection between them. Uh, Wilson introduced his, the uh, text, uh, oh, oh, it's something. This is the, the performance is structured classically, he said, uh, uh, when the Budapest, before the Budapest performance, he wrote a short two-page long introduction to the play. In this, he said, the performance is structured classically, five parts and the prologue, the first being echoed in the fifth part, the second in the fourth. The third part, a wild pagan wedded, wedding ceremony, is the centerpiece. Each part is defined by the materials of scenic elements used on stage wooden planks, leafless branches, steel paper, and sheets of galvanized metal, green branches, contemporary folding chairs, tar paper, and vegetable woven fabrics with silk. Music plays a central role. Uh, we can learn something from Wilson's introduction, but we needn't believe it, because the play itself is quite different from this. This introduction is again a free association, a kind of performance from uh, Wilson. Uh, why did he mention the third part, for example? So it's a question. Uh, how, why the, not the fourth? Why not the fifth? And so on. So um, the logic, the seemingly descriptive introduction, doesn't belong to the textual level of the performance. It's not about the parts of, from the Oedipus play of Sophocles. 
but more connected to the visual events on the scene. The dominant allegories, of, uh, the Oedipal construction of the world looks like this. Uh, Wilson said the central theme of the story of Oedipus to me is darkness. It's absolutely important. He was to shed light on the murder of lions to free the city of Thebes from the plague. But is he able to bear the light when it, is, it shines on him at last? Is he able to confront his past, his origin? As Tiresias, the blind seer, puts it, as long as Oedipus has a sight, he is blind. When he starts to see the truth, he blinds himself. Can we bear to look at the truth today? So it's a very important uh, introduction. This is the Budapest scene uh, before the start of the play. Uh, again, there is the darkness and there are the lights, very important lights. Um, the prologue uh, drawn into this duality of light and, light and dark is the initiative scenes before the play, which depicts three allegorical metonymic aspects of the existence and life ontology. One is the sun, Apollo. Um, the source of the blinding light, the source of the prophecy, the oracle, in whose light a definite responsible self, never fulfilled here but only realized in Colonus by Oedipus, is born from the confused mass of desires. Oedipus and we, the audience, are confronted with this blinding sun, while Apollo, the sun, remains invisible, the players on the scene. They never look up to the uh, upper uh, level. Oedipus and uh, the role of the sun, Apollo, is decisive in the construction of the self in, the sh in shaping Oedipus' life. The sun, Apollo, creates and maintains a gaze. The, a gaze whose existence and self-destructive capacity in individual life were described by Jean-Paul Sartre in his Existence and Nothingness and Lacan, Jacques Lacan in his 1964 seminar. The idea is that the human individual looks at the world and understands it as his own, he's very proud of this, and thinks of himself as a coherent, reliable center. This was Oedipus at the beginning of the play. Um, and he didn't know uh, the repressed uh, background of the uh, Apollonian message in that time. Wilson's presentation is different. In opposition of the proud look of the Oedipus, an opposite gaze of Apollo is present from the first moment. This is very different from Sophocles and different from Freud as well. On, uh, on the visual level, and shortly after the prologue in the text, comes in the oracle, which is again the product of the son of Apollo. The gaze is an objective relation that denies the power of the look, this is Lacan, uh, that points to the uh, otherness of desire, a kind of heterogeneous effect that prohibits the creating of one's own desire into life. So I got the gaze and I can do anything else but somehow integrate this gaze into myself and work with it. And that, that's what uh, Oedipus did in his, play, in his uh, tragedy. The gaze, um, uh, will, according to Lacan, the gaze creates the individual from an outside position where we never see ourselves. In Wilson theater, the gaze is permanently present. It has a decisive role and it is a blinding light that emanates from the dark. In the, uh, in, the, in the subject, Oedipus and we, the spectators too, um, disappear and absorbed in this gaze. I show, uh, oh. I, it comes later. The second um, uh, such uh, uh, allegorical element, allegorical metonymic element is a knotted rope. Again, this doesn't play an important role in Freud and in Sophocles. Um, this, uh, this is the rope that uh, the father, Laius, under the influence of the Apollonian oracle, pierced the legs of the three-day-old infant, tied his ankles, 
wanted to prohibit Oedipus to find his way, and this is the reason why Laius is killed on the road, on the way. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, could not, uh, Oedipus couldn't go on with his life. The rope is an allegorical metonymic sign of the trauma, of this uh, early trauma. Trauma is an event, memory, uh, which is imperceptible when it happens. Oedipus, the infant freed from the robe, becomes a successful man, a royal successful in Corinth, and so on. As an adult, however, this traumatic past, uh, Freud described this in, with the terms of nachträglichkeit after wordness, returns and disrupts the possibility of life. In positive sense, this trauma returns when Oedipus met the Sphinx, because the Sphinx enigma was connected with walking, going. Uh, in negative sense, the aftermath of the trauma is the plague in the city and the reality of the or oracle. The trauma is written into the name and body of Oedipus, which uh, in Greek means uh, uh, a person who, is, who can walk properly, into the body of his community through the plague. The third, much less allegorical, uh, uh, more symbolic metonymic pictorial components of the introduction scene is the gap, the dark entrance between the walls. The gap in my interpretation is the body of the mother, the abject place of birth and incest, the rightful realm of the father of Apollo and Laios, the sun always appears in this, in this gap. For Oedipus, the mother was a great joy, a jouissance, and a disgusting horror as well. This can be the depth of the unconscious, the motherly archive, the elemental darkness. So she's the darkness. Oh my God, <laughs> five minutes. Mm, uh, so, and uh, I have a quotation from Derrida, but I jumped it to speed it up. The prologue happens very slowly. Um, this is the end of the prologue. Uh, Oedipus appears and starts to walk toward the sun. And uh, uh, Oedipus uh, opposed to the sun, the light, approaches the horroristic motherly gap occupied by Apollo. And finally, he's eaten up by the light on this picture you can see this, with the existentially unbearable too much light in the sun's gaze. His clothing is a translucent shroud, his body is a dark line, he stands in absolute light, and his entire upper body, body disappears, absorbed in the light, leaving the two legs that was pierced by Laius and connected with the rope. Then the stage transformed, and furnished with Oedipal persons and object. The scene that becomes present through the whole performance. This is the scene. Uh, the players are this, this shepherd on the side. Uh, this is a narrator. Uh, that's Jocaste in this strange cover. Uh, and another, uh, wit uh, on the scene uh, paper it was said, witness, witness one and witness two. And Oedipus is up there, uh, going into the sun, in a sense. Um, there are some generative, uh, general characteristic features of the text. The text is spoken by, not spoken by characters. So there is not a single moment when Oedipus says something in the play. But everything is said by the narrators. Uh, there are several Oedipuses. I have some more pictures. This is the Vicenza scene. It's a fantastic uh, Baroque theater from the late 16th century. Um, and here you can see that there are several Oedipuses. This, this is the baby Oedipus with his rope. This is the grown-up Oedipus opposing the sun. And uh, some other Oedipuses will come in. So the person is fragmented. There is no coherent figure in the text. There are no di dialogues in the text, only narration, mostly told by, in Epidaurus by that Greek uh, uh, actress. Here, it is 
Theresias, who is telling the story, really. Okay. I have two minutes, so I'll show you what I would like to talk about <laughs> <laughs> next time. Uh, uh, Wilson had an introduction to the text in this Budapest. He said that the stage, no, no, this is an introduction to the life and times of Freud, but it can be connected with this play. A stage is divided into zones. There are three zones, says, um, you can see them here. I think that the lower zone is the id, the unconscious. The second zone is the life, the ego. And the upper zone is the über ich, the uh, what ego? Super ego, yeah. So, uh, the super ego, that is the Apollonian sun and Oedipus facing them. And uh, one minute. And so the, the other thing I would like to, uh, wanted to talk about is the oracle. The, the oracle is a very special linguistic action because it is an, a speech act. The oracle is something that becomes done and it's an active dolog, uh, active thing uh, in spite of being a linguistic expression. And the oracle is absolute center in Wilson because it is said 10, 15 times in the play. Very short text is used from Sophocles, but it's repeated all the time. Many, many re repetitions are there. Uh, so it's, uh, it, and then comes the next, uh, uh, here I brought some pictures of the different, this is Oedipus, that is Oedipus, and that is Oedipus. So different Oedipus figures appear on the scene, while the text is said in the background by the narrators. This is the patricide, the part three. It's about the killing of the father. And um, it's again very interesting because it says that five killed, uh, five were in the surrounding group of the father of Laios. And Oedipus was so strong that he killed everybody. That's then. This is the next thing. And I have a text uh, from the play. And then the, it is very, Excellent, we should listen to it. That would be the best thing to listen to the play from video uh, because they, they make a very strong noise on dancing on these uh, iron plates. And this is the incest scene. Uh, the uh, Laios and Jocaste uh, um, and Oedipus there. And under them, a dance with these green shrubs, a dance of the Jewish sons comes. And it's very interesting that uh, Oedipus looks like a uh, paints. Uh, it, he has that form. Yeah, yeah, uh, I will finish in a moment. I show only that. And at the end uh, uh, scene, there are many chairs are brought up. And this is where Wilson's personal presence is uh, in the text, because Wilson said in an interview that his mother could sit on a chair as nobody else. And uh, uh, he had an interview with Umberto Eco where he said that uh, chairs are absolutely important things in the world. And so this is the mother presence. She is the mother of Wilson and the mother of Oedipus and the lover of Oedipus as well. Okay, I finished. And this is the moment when uh, Oedipus nearly kills. And that's the end, and the end, one moment, one word only, uh, Oedipus becomes similar to the, the baby Oedipus, a naked man, just these white uh, trousers on him. So they, are, they become very similar. This is the, oh, that's, that's the, yeah, and uh, this is what I want. I wanted to show that, where the uh, shepherd uh, leads in the baby Oedipus, the uh, blinded Oedipus is over there, the mother is there, and uh, horroristic figures are coming in that scene. And from these horroristic figures comes out of the blinded Oedipus. Thank you very much. Sorry for that. Okay, I think we have time for two or three questions. Does anyone have uh, a question for Antal Bokai?
Um, I know uh, Robert Wilson also staged the Stravinsky Oedipus Rex, so I was wondering if um, uh, how the two different productions compare. Have you seen the Stravinsky? This? No, I wasn't uh, born that's yet. That's my problem. <laughs> I, uh, that's the problem with Wilson. When we work on Wilson, we can see only a very few things. It's nearly impossible. How can I travel to Lisbon to uh, go in one moment? And I can get a trick ticket. That's the other thing. <laughs> so, and the Wilson Center doesn't produce uh, proper uh, videos about this. So I was absolutely lucky because I could get the Epidaurus uh, projection um, performance on video and I could use it for my uh, analysis because to see once in Budapest, it's not enough. So uh, we may try to get the Stravinsky version. It's a good idea, thank you very much. I try to get it. Maybe the Wilson Center can give us. <laughs> I would suggest them to, to make a, a shop and sell these things. I would be very glad to pay for, for these. Of course, the earlier plays, uh, the 60s, 70s, are not available, really, because in that time they didn't have the technical background. But from the end of the 20th century and the 21st century, plays sh probably should be available. Okay. okay. Just to say, it, it was a very, very good objection about, about uh, Stravinsky cocktail oratoria because it goes into the same, same direction. I have two things to say about it. One is <coughs> that uh, we heard this uh, morning talking about the importance of uh, Wilson staging operas and comparing Puccini to Rondon with Einstein on the beach, which is heavily, I objected heavily because Wilson cannot do with the opera what he does with his work. And, uh, and um, he's not choosing casting, he doesn't have uh, uh, touching, uh, the, cannot touch a comma of the libretto, etc. When he was doing uh, 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 oratorio, <coughs> uh, oh, sorry. he had a great idea that he did not have with uh, Puccini and Trudeau to do a silent prologue, which took about half hour before oratorio, so that's, that's, uh, that's my first reaction. Second one is that uh, the staging of oratorio was the stairs of uh, tribunal in Waco, mm -hmm. which was his father's uh, place. He was a lawyer and the mayor of Waco. So authority of those stairs are discussed uh, in some texts, and that was the only, only uh, decor that he did. Yeah. So those two, two reactions to this particular thing. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, this. My, no, no, my question is... Addition. Uh, no, no, there is no question. It's okay. just a yeah. it can comment. Be, it can be without a question. Okay. okay. The question is... <laughs> uh, I think we have time for one more question. Yes? Thank you for that really fascinating talk. Um, I was, I was really, I found compelling um, the central theme of the story of Oedipus to me, to Robert Wilson, is darkness. He vows to shed light on the murder of Laius to free the city of Thebes. Just thinking of that in terms of the importance of light um, for Wilson, um, having, when you saw the production, how does that express itself, um, his play of light in a story which for him is about darkness and yeah. the shedding of light? Like that the narrative is actually about the thing that principally interests Wilson in the theater, which is yeah. light. Yeah, probably Wilson was, uh, uh, had a terrible childhood that we know from his uh, interviews. And uh, he uh, struggles with this childhood all the time, never directly into the place, but uh, indirectly talking about this all the time. So it's only in this last scene with the chairs, which is connected directly with the mother, that we can, but we don't, but you are true, the light is, is absolutely important, that the fatherly uh, message or the fatherly, strong father's uh, prohibiting reaction to the child and uh, the stuttering that Wilson fought with. So it's very interesting how his uh, self-analysis uh, 
appears in the plays. So just how Freud self-analyzed himself and started to remember early childhood events of his life, which otherwise didn't come up in his memory, Wilson does the same. He puts on the stage. And in a sense, we all have similar experiences in my early childhood, but we don't remember them. But we re repeat uh, these early childhood uh, situations in our grown-up life. So that's, that's okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, our next speaker is John P. Bray, who is an associate professor and graduate coordinator in the Department of Theater and Film Studies at the University of Georgia. He's also a playwright, anthology editor, and independent screenwriter. And his topic this afternoon is They Asked Me to Draw a City, Stage Directions, and I mean, New Imaginings yeah. in Robert Wilson's Direction of Strindberg's A Dream Play. Where did my computer go? Hmm? I had my gone, computer up gone. here. Is it, oh, is it down there? Okay. Yeah. Cool. We saved it. <laughs> All right. This will take me about 10 seconds, so talk amongst yourselves. And Thank you, sir. I try to wear one outfit whenever I present. Okay. Seems like it's working. Yeah, it's there. It's there. All right. In his online presentation on Zoom in 2021, as part of the Georgia Summit of Theater Innovators, Robert Wilson took a marker and he explained to his viewers that he was once asked to design a city as an assignment for an architecture class taught by Sybil Maholi Naj at the Pratt Institute. He drew an apple with a cube inside. He explained, quote, the crystal cube is the core of the community. It can reflect the universe, the world. Wilson equates the cube with a space such as a cathedral in the middle of a medieval village, a place for communal and personal reflection. Quote, a cathedral is a place where if you were rich or if you were poor, you could enter. It was a place where composers showed music, played music, painters showed paintings. It was the center, the core of the apple. As quoted in Kathy Turner's book, Dramaturgy and Architecture, Wilson says, quote, what I learned from Sybil Maholi Naj was to apply order and disorder in a way that was meaningful. I think that's my fascination with architecture. An architect can design a structure, but within that structure, you can let your imagination run free. He continues, during her lectures, she presented us in rapid succession with a car from 1950, a Renaissance painting, a Baroque chandelier, a Byzantine mosaic, a chair by Frank Lloyd Wright, a shoe from the early 19th century, so that I could hardly avoid grasping the inherent correlation between architecture and theater, end quote. This correlation between architecture and theater would speak to Wilson's process, his vision, for theatrical creation. And by theatrical creation, I mean his dance plays, his silent operas, as well as approach to scripted plays, established stories, and so on. He creates a visual book that is the elements of design and movement, and the audio book, spoken text, and so on, separately. So that, quote, when I put them together, they are running in opposition. But I find moments of shifting so that they are in line, end quote. He furthermore states, my work is not arbitrarily placed. At the end, when they come together, it is not a collage. I consciously construct the dualism between what I'm hearing and what I see and how they reinforce each other. It is with his direction of established modernist plays that this paper is primarily concerned. So I'm going to focus on Wilson's 1998 production of Strindberg's A Dream Play, which I had the opportunity to see at BAM in the year 2000. This piece has stayed with me for 24 years, which, by the way, is half my life. 
My argument is Wilson, through his process, was able to penetrate an impenetrable play, though many directors have tried, and offer us the cube inside of the apple while solving the mystery of Strindberg's play. August Strindberg. 1849 to 1912 is often mentioned in the same breath as competitor Henrik Ibsen and contemporary Anton Chekhov. Strindberg cemented his status as a great writer of naturalism with Miss Julie in 1888, but he would move towards abstract symbolist works that would anticipate expressionism. To sum up his biography, in his life, Strindberg would marry and divorce three times. He was an atheist, a Catholic, a spiritualist, an occultist, a misogynist, a champion of women's rights, a painter, photographer, and he suffered deeply from paranoia and persecution syndrome. At one point, he was convinced that somebody was making copies, what we would think of as clones of himself and populating the world. Contradictions abound. Strindberg's life was that of an agonized seeker driven by madness, lust, wonder, and despair. In 1892, Strindberg became involved with artists and thinkers such as Edward Munch, who believed truly that there was something beyond the physical, natural world. During the 1890s, Strindberg had attended lectures on the science of dreams in Paris, including, as Susan Perdo notes, some of the same lectures attended by Sigmund Freud. From this moment, Strindberg would reject naturalism entirely and move his plays dealing with the unconscious life. His plays, To Damascus One and Two, written in 1888, Imaged as Liberty Haverty, uh, Linda Haverty Rugg states, quote, an associative logic in a dreaming consciousness, a logic that disregards ordinary constructs of space and time, a logic that disregards distinctions between persons, a logic that argues for a vast unknown territory of mind beneath the light of consciousness. Harry Carson, a Strindberg translator and scholar, argues that through his photographic and painted works, Strindberg was attempting to find himself via a process of control and surrender of the vision confronting him. This act of seeking with the hope of control and later surrender speaks to the central character daughter's plight in a dream play as she, the daughter of Vedic god Indra, climbs down from heaven to understand why humans suffer, what makes humans suffer, and perhaps by living as a mortal, how she may ease suffering, hoping to gain not just an understanding of despair, but control, ultimately learning the futility of such hopes, but gaining compassion. The structure of a dream play emulates that of a medieval morality play, in which a central protagonist meets alleg allegorical characters who, even if they have given names stated in the dialogue, are known by their position, officer, poet, glazier, and so on. As she journeys, her father Indra warns of humans that, quote, complaint is her mother tongue. Agnes befriends a soldier who has been kept prisoner in a castle built on manure, adorned with a chrysanthemum bud who pines for actress Victoria. He will age, age backwards, and wait. Time and space have no meaning in this journey. That's something that Strindberg says in the preface as well as in the play itself. She marries lawyer, a pragmatic man, who works for the poor and is besotted by the anguishing repetition of life's tasks. Once the handkerchiefs are clean, they need to be cleaned again. A maid takes care of their house, pasting the cracks in the windows and walls, saying, I paste, I paste. It's a justice kind of a movement. Uh, towards the close of the play, the various allegorical, allegorical characters, excuse me, gather outside of the castle near a high closed door of stage. There is a fire. Each character casts an object that represents who they are. Fisherman's green net, gl the glazier's diamonds, the soldier's roses, into the flames. Behind the large door, again it's closed, is the answer to the mystery of life. The learned men debate the theological, scientific, and political ramifications of opening the door. The door is opened, and there is nothing behind it. Daughter returns to the heavens, recognizing that humans have spiritual hopes, spiritual reflections, and even awakenings, but lack the potency to affect real change. She declares with compassion, oh, now I know all the pain of being. This is what it's like to be human. You miss even things you didn't value, even wrongs you didn't commit. 
You want to go and you want to stay, and so the heart is divided. The last image Strindberg leaves us with is a castle burning, the wall behind being made of human faces, quote, questioning, grieving, despairing, as the chrysanthemum blooms. This is from five sec, uh, five sec, all right. Staging a dream play as written is a daunting task. As Sue Prudeau writes in her substantial biography of Strindberg, he initially, quote, wanted to use a magic lantern in order to create a set of dissolving images, like a dream in which the action takes place. But the technology could not be mastered, so he stipulated the scenery must be stylized, not naturalistic, end quote. In the end, he suggested abstract drops to be quickly moved to not break the flow of action, another near impossible task. The play was staged for the first time in Stockholm in 1907. Uh, it starred his wife at the time, uh, Harriet Mose, and it was not a success, but it has enjoyed numerous productions helmed by the likes of Max Reinhardt, Ingmar Bergman, and Robert Wilson. Prior to his stage of Ibsen's When We Dead Awaken, which we'll hear about a little bit later, Wilson worked primarily outside of scripted works. As Maria Shestova argues, quote, for Wilson, the autonomy of production was beyond question. A production was a work in and of itself, not merely an animated text. In other words, the established practice of the director serving as translator of the literary canon was at odds with how Wilson conceived his work. However, it was through collaborations with Heiner Mueller that Wilson would become open to staging established texts. When Wilson directs modern stage plays, Shostova says, the point for Wilson was not to accommodate his methods to these principles of drama spoken and sung, but to shape them to his staging methods. Wilson's methods with his dance plays, operas, and established plays are similar. He is both improvisational, which has a structure, has a form, and classicist. Structure is of the utmost importance. For example, when discussing one of his works, Wilson took out his marker again, this was at the Georgia Theater Summit, making a diagram. Quote, I made a 12-hour silent play in seven acts. Forgive the picture, I took them off my computer as he was talking. One and seven are related. Two and six are related. Three and five are related. And it spirals in the middle of the fourth act and it spirals out. This is the same structure as King Lear. The early parts, the upper parts, the king is in the man-made world. This part, the later part, he goes into nature. The center line, I shall go mad, says the king, is the turning point. A dream play as written contains 14 scenes, staged by Wilson using 13 tableaus. For this setting, Wilson found inspiration in American photographs from the beginning of the 20th century. The production begins and ends with a tableau of the same two-story farmhouse, which resembles a hyperrealist pencil sketch rendering of a photograph. In the first scene, we see Agnes on her journey, uh, from the heavens in a much different way than prescribed by Strindberg. In his stage direction, Strindberg describes backdrops with, quote, clouds that resemble crumbling slate mountains with ruins of castles and fortresses, noting that constellations of Leo, Virgo, and Libra can be seen. Between them is a planet Jupiter shining brightly. Indra's daughter is standing on the highest cloud. In Wilson's production, we see Agnes played wonderfully by Jessica Liedberg on a sort of seesaw, walking downwards from the heavens at an angle. Because we understand the first tableau will tie in with the last, the play will end with Agnes during, journeying back up the seesaw in the opposite direction. In other words, scene one is connected to scene 13 and so on. Jessica Liedberg's movements are slow, specific, and gorgeously choreographed through space and time. The effect, I argue, is the same for both Strindberg's suggestions and Wilson's direction. A godly figure travels to Earth. At the start of the production process, Wilson led a silent workshop with performers to create the overall movement and physicality for each scene without consideration for the spoken dialogue. This is what Shestova calls the movement score, which is learned through repetition. The movements were recorded on video and the performers studied them for months. The marriage of movements and photographs used for the tableaus became Wilson's visual book for the rest of the production. Even the stillness of Agnes in the opening tableau recalls a recorded photograph. We are watching photos slowly move into life and the actors fill up those moments. The movement of each performer and their sound created the rich dreamlike space. The glazier with his squinted eyes and chuckle. 
The milking maids, who, when each one opened their mouths, let out a sound, including glass being broken. Um, a quick note, the sequence was not in Strindberg's play, but rather a comedic interlude by Wilson. Jae Young Hong notes that in this production, quote, the actors did not look anybody in the eye on stage. All actors on stage looked as if they're playing for themselves rather than for the um, audience. Soldiers sing some of his lines, and when the characters gather by the fire to burn their precious objects in effigy, Wilson, rather than having them stand around a fire, has the characters sit in bleachers, holding their objects. As they let go, each object raises up, floating center stage, as if becoming the smoke. In the seventh scene of the play as written, which structurally is where everything spirals towards and from, Lawyer laments to daughter that he, is not, that he has been refused doctoral wreaths at a ceremony in town. The setting is described as a church chancel. Daughter, speaking with lawyer, says she will plead his case to the heavens to ease his misery. In their fragmented conversation, she says when she looks in the mirror and sees, she sees the world as it really is. Lawyer suggests that life is the false copy, the reflection of the real. This is important for how Wilson will stage the scene. Church bells are heard, and daughter entices lawyer to marry her. As she does so, Strindberg tells us the background will transform into Fingal's uh, cave, which he calls Grotto, with water crashing behind them, quote, producing a sound ensemble between wind and waves. Lawyer laments, but I'm poor. She says, well, what does that matter as long as we love each other? A little beauty costs nothing. Lawyer, maybe the things I like you'll dislike. Daughter, then we'll compromise. Lawyer, and if we tire of each other, daughter, then a child will come and bring us delights that are always new. Lawyer, and you'll have me, an outcast, poor, ugly, and despised. Daughter, yes, let us join our destinies. Lawyer, so be it then. In Wilson's presentation, we don't have the cave, we don't have the water, we instead have this kind of arc of the stage left, seen here, and these many bricks. The bricklayers are working while the music starts up and swells beneath them. But then the entire scene, thank you five, is played uh, a second time. So the first time the black backdrop, and this is memory, was um, red, and the second time the backdrop here instead of red was blue. We are watching both the original and the mirror, the first and the copy. And the second time the lights in the audience pulse because at that moment, we in the theater became as both the copy and the original. In other words, the real and the reflection and the reflection as real, entwined with what we were experiencing on stage. We were inside the cube, inside the apple, the space for reflection. It was a spiritual moment, as we talked about, we heard about spiritual moments earlier. This moment also encapsulates, uh, encapsulates Wilson's own thoughts on the entirety of the play itself. In his words, quote, what he called a dream play, in a sense, it's very concrete. You just blinked your eyes. What did you see? You don't know, but it's a part of seeing. It's a negative image. Maybe for a fraction of a second you were dreaming. I don't know, but this interior image was there. We see both the interior and exterior things all the time. the original, and the reflection. We are fragmented and we are whole. Wilson offers Strindberg's contradictions in a way that is remarkably concrete while retaining the quest of the spiritual aspirant. As Joseph Melillo, the former artistic director of the Brooklyn Academy of Music states, quote, I think it's magical how a playwright and Wilson coming together reveals itself in unique, distinct ways. When Wilson puts on Strindberg's dream play, the surprise was that you found yourself saying, oh yeah, he made sense out of this obtuse play. <laughs> or to borrow from Guardian critic Michael Billington, who was moved by Wilson's production, quote, if life, as Strindberg suggests, is a meaningless dream, is one to be suffered with maximum grace. To conclude, Wilson's process was ideal for this play, I argue, as Wilson and Strindberg together created the most wonderful and haunting dream. As Harry Carlson notes in his introduction to his translation, that in a dream play, quote, the characters split, double, redouble, evaporate, condense, fragment, cohere. But one consciousness is superior to them all, that of the dreamer. And while the dreamer for Strindberg is daughter, Wil for Wilson's production, we are the dreamer, which is what makes his production sublime. 
So he crosses, Wilson finds a play, and by doing so, creates Strindberg's desires, excuse me, Strindberg's desired space for personal reflection and compassion. So that, Okay. Okay. Any questions for John T. Bray? I might not know the answer. I can make something up. So I can just project. Uh, so you mentioned that he creates both visual and audio books separately. Um, and then strings them together. I know for the visual books, there's these, these storyboards that he creates alongside like the sketches. Right. Is there an accompanying like document for the audio books, um, like a document recording or anything like that that's uh, actually a piece of that? Oh, thank you for asking. So the audio book for this production, of course, was a script, yeah. which was um, edited a okay. bit. Um, but also the music by um, his longtime collaborator, Michael Galasso. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing his name. Um, who, as part of the process, you know, also got the gist, went off and did what he was going to do. And I, I, I almost imagine, if you don't mind the metaphorical image, of Wilson kind of sewing it all together, mm -hmm. you know, it, but in a way that is so formalized that it somehow works. I can't imagine anybody else trying this and making it work. You know, the question before, can Strindberg, or Ken Strindberg, excuse me, can Wilson be taught? You know, can you ta teach people how to do that? I'm a little skeptical, because it seems so unique to his own process. Um, but to answer the question, the audio book, were, and the sound effects too, right? When the, when the performers open their mouths, the different, so the, the, the maid milking scene, what I remember is that the one opened her mouth and it was like the, the glass being broken, somebody else, and there was like the moo of a cow. Um, and even in that comedic interlude, you had this kind of jockey character walk out with a walking stick, and there was a voiceover that as he looked around, you heard the voiceover say, hmm, 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 and then the word, okay. And it tickled the funny bone I didn't know I had. But my hunch is that would be part of the audiobook. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh, yeah. I was surprised at the projection you showed, which, is, which was very similar to the text Wilson told about the Oedipus play, these levels. Yeah. Uh, it would be interesting to see if it really sticks to every Wilson play or not. So it's, I don't know what you, uh, I also projected it and you did. What's the difference and similarity between them? The other question is that what language was this? It was in Swedish. Swedish, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, the, the version that I saw was in Swedish. And which was is it in Swedish shown in America? It was in Swedish shown in America, and there were super titles uh, projected. Yeah, because it's a very interesting thing, because the Oedipus play was, uh, the text was said in Old Greek, Ancient Greek, Modern Greek, French, German, and English. Imagine what the, of course, on the theater, there was a text in the play, language of the place, which translated this, but it's interesting how Wilson plays with these languages, if it, this, this was in Oh, school. sure, and of course the language is, the, the importance of the spoken word is, is, is I mean, I'm, I'm borrowing from post-traumatic theater now, like reduced, but what's funny for Strindberg himself is that it almost became an opera, that, that a composer had talked to him about making Dream play an opera, and he said, yes, we can do that, but please cut out all of the philosophizing. Let's streamline it. Let's just make it closer to just the key characters. But it never came into fruition. Just showing how much Strindberg, the importance that Strindberg put on the text later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Um, in addition to everything you described Strindberg as, he was also an alchemist. Yes. Um, and so I'm thinking about alchemy and then Wilson's scenography as well. And I'm wondering about you know, as, as Strindberg tried to melt uh, metals and create gold. Yeah, cetera, gold, yeah. 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 Um, how that might uh, have a reading to Wilson's sonography and, and to a dream play. That's a really good question. I'm not sure if I have a, a good answer for you right now. Um, that is something that needs reflection. So, um, but I mean, certainly if we're talking about the disparate elements of his 
you know, stenography, these 1903 photographs of America, and then the, the, the text of the play. Um, I mean, th that's, yeah, it's a good, how does that create the gold that is Wilson's vision? I'm, I'm not sure. It worked. I, I would argue it worked. Um, but uh, it's the magic of, of Wilson's theater, perhaps. And I know that 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to have a much better answer. I'm going to kick myself. But yeah, thank you for that, though. Yeah, we can talk about it later. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Anyone else? Then I have, I have one final question. Uh, you know, you, 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 you said towards the end that basically uh, the audience becomes the dreamer. Yes. Yes. Could you kind of elaborate on that? I mean, what? Well, I think with, um, and he said this himself, that when we watch one of his performances that we're invited to daydream, and he talks somewhere about how we have, um, what do you refer to it as, like an interior screen, and that there are things that we take with us when we leave and other things we kind of forget. And in that moment, I felt like we became conscious of the dream because it was such a lovely moment. The, it, it's my memory, so I, I, I hope it's accurate. But when the, the first time that the, the action was played, the, the marriage was played, the music kind of came up gradually and took us by surprise. Whereas the second time, the, um, the, the brick workers were sitting and they immediately started singing their song and, um, and we were aware that this was, like, didn't we just see this? But it was new. And so it, it kind of ca caused a little bit of a jolt, almost like a startled, like, second awakening. You know, like, like did, is this, am I seeing this right? And then when the lights happened, there was just this included moment where we were linked. Um, so I would say that we were conscious of the dream in that moment, almost startled for a moment. But it was a nice enough dream we got back to it. I'm speaking in drafts. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it really was powerful because the veil of separation, I mean, Wilson is very much, in, in the things I've seen at least, the proscenium, it happens here. And in that moment, that wasn't the case anymore. And so we felt, I felt connected. Um, and I felt like this was, oh, this is my dream, right? Oh, this is, this is, this is something I'm doing. I feel projected upon and also projecting, but it was a more of a symbiotic situation. I don't know if that makes sense, but it yeah, was, yeah. It was no, more, no. Uh, more of an effective thing, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And our next presenter is Yoni Oppenheim, who is a director, dramaturg, and translator who has collaborated with such artists as Doug Wright, uh, Hamish Linklater, Dan Safer uh, from Witness Relocation, Moti Lerner, and Lola Arias. Yoni is uh, also the artistic director of 246, a Jewish theater company. And this afternoon, he will talk about Robert Wilson's production of Henrik Ibsen's When We Dead Awaken. Robert Wilson said, I don't like most of Ibsen's plays. Ibsen usually explains too much. 
Robert Wilson's aesthetic and opinion of Ibsen make him seem like a curious choice to direct an Ibsen play. However, to Robert Brustein, founding artistic director of American Repertory Theater, ART, and the Institute for Advanced Theater Training at Harvard, Wilson was the perfect choice to direct When We Dead Awaken at ART in 1991. For decades, Brustein's aim as an educator, critic, scholar, and producer was to, as he told me in an interview, draw Ibsen away from realism. Brustein titled his essay, Arguing for a Non-Causal View of Ibsen's Work, Theater in the Age of Einstein, The Crack in the Chimney. As this title, with its reference to Einstein, suggests, it was Robert Wilson's aesthetic worldview embodied in Einstein on the Beach that epitomized an approach to theater that Brustein wanted applied to Ibsen. He urged theater makers to find the poem inside Ibsen's plays, and it was this view of Ibsen he inculcated in his students at Harvard. Wilson had directed works at ART three times before. In 1986, Brustein invited him to direct Euripides' Alcestis. It was the first time Wilson directed a classical dramatic text. I will note that I saw that he also did a workshop of King Lear prior to that, but that was a workshop and this was a full production. As Brustein stated, Robert Wilson was ideally suited for directing When We Dead Awaken because he can't think in a linear fashion. It's impossible for him. He thinks in terms of images. Robert Wilson's production of When We Dead Awaken in an adaptation by Robert Brustein with musical knee plays by Charles Honey Coles played at ART from February to March 1991 and continued on to the Alley Theater in Houston, Texas in May and to Sao Paulo, Brazil in October of that year. This paper sheds light on the development of that production. An archival video of the production is available to view at the New York Public Library and at ART's archive. Surprisingly, it was not Brustein who came up with the idea of having Robert Wilson direct Ibsen's rarely produced final play. Rather, it was one of his directing students at Harvard, Mary Sutton, who made the suggestion to Brustein upon leaving his modern drama lecture about When We Dead Awaken. Brustein described his phone conversation with Robert Wilson to pitch the show. When I described Ibsen's last play to Bob over a crackling long distance line to Germany, he immediately agreed to direct it, though he hadn't yet read it. It is not at all surprising that Wilson agreed to direct the play solely based on a description of it. His process when directing texts is office, often to have someone synopsize the work for him as he sketches and takes notes. Furthermore, Brustein's interpretation of the play as an image-laden, non-realistic work surely captured Wilson's imagination. Wilson describes his initial reaction to reading the play. I was immediately drawn to it. It's a play that's strange, mysterious, and something we can't completely understand. There was something I just couldn't put my finger on. I don't like things I can understand. If I understand something, I don't want to do it. It doesn't interest me. ART would go on to market Wilson's production of When We Dead Awaken as follows. Rubeck, an aged sculptor played by Alvin Epstein and in Brazil by Joel Gray, vacations with his young dissatisfied wife Maya, Stephanie Roth, at a mountain spa. Irene, his former model and a patient at the local sanitarium played simultaneously by both Elzbieta Chizewska and longtime Wilson collaborator Cheryl Sutton seeks revenge on him for having used her to create his greatest work while rejecting her selfless love. Rubeck realizes that he has sacrificed his soul for the sake of his art, and Maya runs off to cavort with Ulfheim, a bear hunter played by Mario Arambide. Rubeck and Irene ascend to the mountaintop only to be killed by an avalanche. With Wilson signed on to direct, Brustein began writing the adaptation in consultation with Wilson. However, ART's literary director, Robert Scanlon, recalled that, quote, Wilson over and over wished that he could do the play without text at all. His instinct with When We Dead Awaken was, has to been to express this work through massive elemental forms, the mountains in each of the three acts, the water of the sea in the first act, 
the water of the mountain brook in the second act, the snowstorm which whites out the finale of the play and minimize the play's dependence on words. The play does not strike Wilson to be about what people say. Brustein, however, insisted that Wilson use Ibsen's text and wrote an adaptation half the length of the original without, quote, excising anything vital into the action, the characters, or the theme, incorporating preliminary cuts made by the director in honoring Wilson's dislike of the ping pong of conventional dialogue. Wilson prefers his actors focus on their lines and not on the need to respond to the other actor in the scene. Brustein's adaptation, quote, set about rendering Ibsen's strange, occasionally verbose play into a kind of suggestive English he hoped might spark Wilson's imagistic imagination. In rehearsal, Wilson made further cuts. Brustein explained what Wilson wanted to cut, that Wilson wanted to cut the line, when we dead awaken, what? We discover that we never lived. A very important line. He did not want the title in the play. Brustein fought him hard on this and managed to get a compromise which left most of it in. Ultimately, Wilson placed the title in bold multicolored hand lettering on the white stage curtain and it became part of this second of three song and dance neat plays performed at first by Charles Coles and Alvin Epstein's Rubick, who were then joined by the entire cast and it evolved into a tap number. They sang, yes, we fell in love, yes, we fell in love, yes, we fell in love in When We Dead Awaken, and repeated, when we dead awaken, as they shuffled off stage. Rather than cutting the line entirely as, as Brustein feared, Wilson turned the title into a musical number. <laughs> the neat plays were created by Charles Honey Coles, a legendary tap dancer and blues singer-songwriter whom Wilson cast in the role of the manager of the spa. A neat play is Wilson's term for a short vaudevillian routine which he uses in his works to introduce each act. They serve for him as joints linking the show together and function either as a commentary or in counterpoint to the tone of the play. In the first neat play, Charles Honey Coles came on stage and sang a song which begins... who played the first Irene, appeared in a glittering one-piece bathing suit, high heels, and one long red glove to do a Betty Grable from behind cheesecake number as one critic described it. <laughs> Such critics mocked the neat plays as dismissive of Ibsen and an attempt to lighten things up. That review was Ibsen light. However, it makes complete sense that Irene, who says later in the play, I worked in nightclubs, would be performing in such a number. In his attention to the detail of the text, Wilson honored an element of the character's history through the neat play. Instead of proving Wilson's disregard for Ibsen's text, the neat play underscores Wilson's deep understanding of it. Act three was preceded by the final neat play. In this one, Cheryl Sutton, who played the shadow-like second Irene, was in a bathrobe smoking on the side of the stage as Coles gradually walked to a metal hospital bed in front of the When We Dead Awaken curtain as he sang a mournful blues song featuring the line, unless you lived it, felt its messy joy, you can't understand L-O-V-E, the doggonest feeling ever. Wilson maintained the theme of love established earlier, but endowed it with a more serious, mournful tone foreshadowing death in the final act. The production process for a Wilson work is a long one. There were two workshops which preceded rehearsal. By, with Brustein's adaptation in hand, the first workshop took place over five days in July 1990 and focused on developing the design concept of the show and the visual storytelling. 
It began with a production team sitting in Robert Bluestein's office, and as stage manager Abby Katz described it, reading the script several times, stopping whenever anyone had a question, a thought, or a visual association to offer. While we read, Bob sketched. As scenic and costume designer John Conklin notes, we discussed Ibsen's life, personality, and a wide range of topics. The conversation veered from Brecht to Beckett to World War I. Bob Wilson listened, absorbed, and then drew and drew and drew and drew. Bob thinks with his hands, a pencil and a blank sheet of paper, ideas, dreams, images, furniture, skies, mountains, trees, water, and an avalanche all emerged. By the second day, Wilson and Conklin were requesting visual and literary sources based on the previous day's discussion. The office walls are covered with pictures and images, the Grand Canyon, Ibsen walking the streets of Oslo, an alpine hut, mountains and glaciers in Greenland, Gustave Doré's illustration for Dante's Inferno. Assistant dramaturg Dorothy Hannafell provides an example of the impact Doré's illustrations had on Wilson's design. One of these engravings particularly intrigued Wilson while he was sketching several versions of a stone chair which Rubeck sits on in the second act. The picture shows a steep, tall, rocky cliff. Looking at it carefully, Wilson transformed the shape of the cliff into the shape of the stone chair he was working on. Each day, Wilson and Conklin would work together with Conklin building models of every possible design Wilson sketched. The most central element of theater for Wilson is light. And lighting designer Steve Strawbridge used a few lights with color gels to provide a sense of a lighted set. Conklin uh, explained. What begins to emerge is a series of dreamlike evocations of Ibsen's brooding world of, of the mountains of Norway, rendered principally in black, white, and gray. They become the essence of the psychological drama of the play, not an illustration of it. Bob creates an alternate reality, vision and movement divorced from surface narration. He uses juxtaposition and irony to liberate the text from its weight and density. So this last symbolic, heavy dream of Ibsen about failure, frustration, death, and resurrection will have a show curtain in bright, vivid colors, red, blue, yellow letters striding and dancing across a pure white background. It is noteworthy that Conklin discusses the psychological drama of the play in relationship to Wilson's design for the production. Wilson is known for his anti-naturalistic aesthetic, which is not concerned with psychology, at least not in the conventional sense. But in Conklin's opinion, Wilson does deal with the psychological drama on his own terms through the visual world he creates rather than by working with the actors. As Conklin understands it, Wilson is simply choosing alternative modes to tell the story, modes which perhaps honor the mystery of Ibsen's creation more than a naturalistic approach would. By the final day of the workshop, Robert Wilson and his collaborators had a clear outline of the set that Bob envisioned for the production. The second workshop occurred over two weeks in October of 1990, during which Wilson worked with the entire cast and developed the staging. In addition, the designers were present to see how the staging would affect their designs. As alluded to above, Wilson's work with actors is very different from a conventional rehearsal process. As Wilson discussed it with ART News, normally actors start by talking about characters and motivations, discussing what is going on in the play as preparation for rehearsal, where development of relationships and telling of the story are the primary objective. With Wilson, none of this takes place. Actors are told where to go, what to do, including unexplained gestures and poses, and when to speak, usually uninflected in early rehearsals. Wilson also told the actors, I'm not the type of director who is interested in psychology. Knowing where you are going, that's the main thing. Keep it very simple. Beneath it all, it can be very complicated, but let theater always be about one thing and keep that very simple. Essentially, Wilson's movement score creates a mask for the actors that is rigidly set and quite complicated to master, although it keeps things simple. On top of this score, Wilson layers on the text at specific moments. The article explains, actors must take extensive notes on their timing of the text to movement. No explanations are given about what any of these things mean. Wilson likes 
in early rehearsal to explore what he calls the tensions and structures of the space. He likes to start early because he says the visual book should be able to stand on its own. Space is texture and structure, something that can't be talked about. Wilson has said that a line of text should not interrupt the silence and that when you finish a line, it doesn't end. It continues into silence. Once the actors have learned the choreography and where they say their lines, they can fill the rigid form he has provided them. There can be great freedom for the actor within the structure. Wilson is not interested in why the actors do what they do. He just wants them to do it. I don't want to know why I'm doing something. That's why my theater is different, non-interpretive. Interpretation is for the audience. To an extent, the experience the actors have working on the piece is similar to Wilson's aim for the audience's experience. He talks about giving the audience literal and mental space within the theater piece to fill with their consciousness and feeling. Trusting Wilson's method was not always easy for the actors. In the stage manager's production book for the actual production, I found a note to the actors that they must fully commit to Wilson's non-naturalistic style and trust that it will work if they do. The note reprimanded the actors saying that it only looked bad when they do not fully commit to his style. The second workshop ended with a bow probe, a building of a full-size mock-up of the set, which is rarely done in the United States. It is an example of how Wilson and ART introduced European production methods to the American theater. The bow probe allowed Wilson and his designers to see how Wilson's set would work in the actual space and to make adjustments, discuss props. Having the actors there as well allowed the lighting designer, designer to work with Wilson on the lighting before the start of rehearsals. This was a huge benefit considering that lighting is, for Wilson, the most important element and the cues in his production are always painstakingly detailed and precise. The two workshops allowed Wilson and his company to have much of the intricate elements of his design and staging ready to see uh, so that the relatively re short rehearsal period was sufficient time for their production to open on schedule. Despite his wariness of text, Wilson did reinstate one of Brustein's initial cuts, taken from a dialogue from the start of the play between the aging sculptor Rubeck and his young wife Maya as they sit at the spa recalling their train journey there. And here's the text. Although absolutely nothing happened, I knew that we had crossed the border, that we were really home again, because it stopped at every little station. No one got off and no one got on, but the train stood there silently for what seemed like hours. At every station, I heard two railmen walking along the platform, one of them carrying a lantern, and they mumbled quietly to each other in the night without expression or meaning. There are always two men talking about nothing at all. Wilson found this passage to be mysterious and poetic. He amplified the text's mystery by recording and using it as a taped refrain at various points in the play. Dramaturg Robert Scanlon adapted the dialogue into a monologue in rehearsal to remove Wilson's loathed ping pong of dialogue. His focus on the repetition of the text lend te lends insight into what attracted him to When We Dead Awaken in the first place. Throughout his oeuvre, Wilson has had a penchant for train imagery, an interest in silence, and a lack of interest in words. Einstein on the beach has a train scene at the beginning of the opera. In terms of content, this monologue is an expression of a world in which speech is not the primary mode of communication. I heard two railmen walking along the platform. It is a sound of walking, which is initially heard and noted. When they finally speak, they mumble quietly without meaning. The dreamlike quality of the play, this scene, and Wilson's work in general is underscored in this text. Maya thought Rubeck was asleep in the realm of dreams on the train, but he was hearing the silence around him. This Ibsen text can be understood as an expression of Wilson's theatrical aesthetic, and his choice to reinstate the text opens a window into his work methods. Following his rigorous engagement with Ibsen uh, at ART uh, with When We Dead Awaken, Wilson would go on to direct two more Ibsen productions, Lady from the Sea and Per Gint, along with countless productions of classic dramatic texts. Circling back to the Wilson quote I opened with, I don't like most of Ibsen's plays. Ibsen usually explains too much. Well, he continues in that quote, but When We Dead Awaken is different. It's so mysterious. Nothing is as beautiful as a mystery. I like this play because I don't understand it. The minute you think you understand a work of art, it's dead. It's no longer, it no longer lives in you. This play lives on in the mind like a hallucination. It's Ibsen's dream play. 
So in conclusion, I want to show a few images from the production so you could get a sense of Wilson's staging of Ibsen's Green Play when we did Awaken. And here they are. This is Act One, Act Two, and Act Three. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, questions for Yoni Oppenheim. Or Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> you guys took the idea of silence with your heart, I see. I mean, I have a question, or perhaps then a comment. So, I mean, it's, it's really interesting now, you know, we've heard three presentations in a row, and uh, they all kind of, in a certain way, emph emphasize, you know, Dream I mean, the, the dream, notion of the dream, or kind of a dream logic, or the dream structure of these uh, productions, and you just called uh, this production, you know, Ibsen's dream play. Yeah. He calls um, it Ibsen's dream play. Oh, he called it uh, Ibsen's uh, dream play. Um, how, how would you kind of position this, this production with regard to, um, you know, uh, the production of, of a dream play that we've already heard about, right. uh, or the Oedipus? Yeah. Uh, so I mean I haven't seen those, so I can't speak in that in terms of that. But I think um, with this, first of all, I think this is his. This is one of his first engagements with uh, dramatic text. So I think there's uh, presumably a development in his exploration. You know, I don't know if in those other places, Robert Bruce Fien, you know, was a scholar and a, he had a lot of dramaturgical support in the creation as I discussed. I don't know, uh, you know, if he, when he was working in Sweden, if there committed to that in those ways. I'm wondering what that pro th if those processes were the same as what I described in the development of this, or is it something completely different, or he developed a different approach to, or maybe just a comfort uh, in, in, in how he directed text. Um, so it's not really talking about the dream, it's more talking about you know, the, the engagement with text. Um, I think a lot of his work is really taps into s the subconscious when you're watching the plays. And he, uh, I think you mentioned that he's fine with people kind of dozing off or spacing out because that's really what, you know, kind of a cloud passing. That's what um, he's aiming for. Otherwise, he wouldn't be having people, you know, cross the stage incredibly slowly because it's, it feels slow, but he'll say like, well, it's not slow. Like when you look at a cloud, it does pass th at that rate. Um, and it just allow allows us to tap into a different uh, speed and sensibility in our in our existence to be in that space at that time. I mean, the notion of, you know, the inner screen that we already kind of heard about uh, perhaps kind of earlier. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Um, first here in front. Could you talk about the role of ART for Robert Wilson? It seems like in America that was one of the main Theaters where he would continually produce after a time. So, like, what is his relationship, what role did ART play uh, for him? Right. Um, so, yeah, it is one of the you know major. Uh, Maria Chevsova was saying how um, Bruce uh, Wilson is really like this European American director, and so much of his support comes from Europe. And ART was one of the few um, theaters that was supporting and doing his work and interested in giving him not just like do no they did a section of they presented a section of the civil wars and they present and they presented um, like the beginning of a tour of the neat plays but then they actually invite him to direct you know product the, you're talking about Heiner Mueller he works with Heiner Mueller uh, at ART you know the the, the quartet they, they're working on stuff there so I think there's a level of support definitely a level of interest by Bruce Bean, who's very interested in um, Robert Wilson's work and um, that article about the crack in the chimney that the, the theater in the stage in this in the age of Einstein is an interesting essay because you're talking about Ibsen as being a non-causal playwright and really that would be the age of Heisenberg but he chooses specifically to, to talk to, to about Einstein because I think he really wants to connect to Robert Wilson and and, um, and that relationship for those years that they're uh, producing his work is a, a really central one because I think uh, and maybe in Minneapolis they presented a section of the Civil Wars. He did a workshop of I think King Lear maybe with students in California but his work uh, it's very jarring to think how acclaimed an artist is abroad 
and how outside of New York, um, ART is really one of the first places that kind of brings him the attention that it's a bit, the, the disparity is kind of shocking. Uh, and that support, I think, is there largely because Brustein really connected to that aesthetic and wanted to bring that. He was interested in European aesthetics in the, in the American stage, and he really wanted to bring um, opportunities for Wilson to bring that to like the great texts, dramatic texts. Thanks, Sioni. This might be more of a comment than a question, but one of the words that really um, was drawn out from from your uh, presentation was uh, modes, and it was a really um, useful word for me to think about the, the modalities with which Wilson works, um, because he is uh, a director and a sonographer and a choreographer, and so I guess, um, and, and I guess that also opens up, as Viola was saying in earlier today, uh, the ability to read him as through art history as well in, in those pieces, and so, um, when you were looking at the process of this work, in essence, calling forward the dramaturgy, which is often unseen, um, were there any insights about those modalities? Like, uh, I, I know that there's like the process of how he was working, but uh, was there anything that like stood out as, I don't know. Um, um, I think they insist, I mean, uh, many directors, I don't know if this answers the question, but um, one, just about the, the fine, his visual art, I just wanted to note, when this production happened, there was an exhibit of his art happening concurrently. So it's important to also that the theater and the museum are working together because his visual art actually is a major part of his practice. As far as modes, I think the structure that he creates, the sense that there were two workshops, you know, before, before the start of rehearsals, is kind of unheard of, right? In a nonprofit theater works on a certain limited budget, and that he would insist we need this time, and it's and part of the time is we need time for lighting because it takes a lot of time. But we need this time to dramaturgically create this piece, and all these people are going to be in the room with me together to do this work. And I think that for me um, is that, and he, and he's a director who's on the level who can insist on that. You know, if if I came into the thing and I said I need two workshops, they'd be like, you know, see ya. <laughs> The fact that he's of a stature and he, the bow probe, that he's bringing these concepts from Europe where dramaturgy is really central and important um, and sonography has a different level and he's bringing them to the American theater and introducing them in a way. I think for me that's like the mode, the way of working, the insisting on a certain type of process because that's what he needs to create his work and that he's an artist of a high enough level and I think Robert Buskin was a person, an artist of enough integrity to allow that to happen. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, thank you for your analysis about how uh, Wilson take, um, handled this mysterious plate of Ibsen's. I'm curious about, um, through your analysis of um, Wilson's, analysis, uh, Wilson's aesthetics um, dealing with Ibsen's, what, what, do you, what do you discover about Ibsen's through the lens of Wilson? That's a, that's a great question. Um, that Ibsen called this a dramatic epilogue, and it wasn't because he thought it would be it was his last play because he got a stroke. He didn't think it would be his last play, and he said that he was going to come c come with new tools to create the next thing. Uh, so I think what the what um, Wilson is showing is what some of those tools might have been, because Ibsen himself was a start off as a painter. So like it's two visual artists actually in conversation with one another, um, and I think that and he was also a director. Um, I think those overlaps. Uh, speak to it for me personally, what stood out watching that archival footage then, I was in Norway that year, they did Lady from the Sea, so I saw the Polish version, were the knee plays. And it's such a, you think of uh, Wilson as this European American director, maybe a bit pretentious, but those knee plays are so, you heard from the music, so joyous and vaudevillian and so American, and it's really exciting to see him really own his Americanness in other contexts and, and kind of juxtapose that to his own personal aesthetic, because even the movement scores, he, he builds those on his body. So I, people have said, the movements that you're seeing, you're really seeing something really personal, because you're seeing Wilson's body and Wilson's movement in the bodies of all these other people. Uh, and that's like a very personal thing, if we go back to kind of your uh, talk earlier. And I think those are some of the things that stood out for me.
Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next presenters will be Abraham Oz and Tal Izaki. Uh, Tal Izaki is the director of Alpha Theater in Tel Aviv. Uh, she has designed over 250 shows in Israel and abroad. She created and headed the University of Haifa's theater design program as well as taught at Tel Aviv University. Uh, Tal was a visiting artist at Columbia University and in addition to lecturing and conducting workshops worldwide, she has uh, uh, curated numerous design exhibitions, including six uh, design exhibitions at the Prague uh, Quadrennial, uh, and she has also kind of translated plays. Um, Abraham Oz is Professor Emeritus at the University of Haifa. He has translated numerous plays and operas, shared theater departments at Tel Aviv University, at the University of ha uh, Haifa, and taught at home and abroad. Avraham has published books and articles, edited periodicals, as well as TV and radio programs. Uh, he was the Associate Artistic Director at the Kameri Theatre, and he's also directed productions by Shakespeare Pinter, as well as his own plays. And both Avraham and Tal will talk about time shadows, gendered and ungendered communities, and Robert Wilson's conceptual combat with Shakespeare's sonnets. A word, of the <coughs> A word on the time limit. Uh, we were advised that uh, 2,500 words equal 20 minutes. Now, this paper is 2,499. <laughs> so, if I, so if I overstep my time limit, it's the estimation of the organizer to be blamed. Now. <coughs> Let us start by... deliberated vulgar gestures or grotesque grimaces of Robert Wilson's stage figures delivering performative, uh, per performatively Shakespeare sonnets in his 2009 Berlin Ensemble production. The path uh, leading from classical archetypal youth and uh, medieval heroic romance or religious compulsive single master narrative towards humanist individualism navigated Western human consciousness through common narratives related to historical characters or their likes in the intimacy of modern fiction. Shakespeare the dramatist is a master storyteller of such narratives following the footsteps of uh, Chaucer, Boccaccio, or Rabelais, accompanying uh, contemporaries like Cervantes and preceding the Molières, Dickenses, or Dostoevskys of later years. The failures of the Enlightenment culminating in Auschwitz or Hiroshima undermined the rule of narratives and led artistic creation into the decomposition or deconstruction. Robert Wilson, among others, initialized his artistic project, uh, this, uh, his artistic for encountering the rule of verbal narratives or reference to realism by clinging to abstract visual and musical images. This is a rather simplistic outline of the cultural scene of modernity and postmodernity, yet it may serve to delineate what one may designate as the battleground on which Robert Wilson meets Shakespeare's sonnets at the outset of the current millennium. And uh, in our topical reading of his product, is doubly emphasized in a world continuously turning its back to its age-old origins in humanist narratives. The topic of uh, Wilson's deconstruction of the dramatic text, be it Shakespeare's, Ibsen's, Kushner's, or others, has been exhausted by him and a host of commentators. Enough would be to attend a production of Per Gint in Norwegian, knowing the play but not the language, to experience the mechanism of his intriguing work in separating the verbal from the visual and musical. 
His theatrical rendition of Shakespeare's sonnets, however, is a different histrionic challenge, varying from Wilson's other encounters with the bard, such as King Lear, The Tempest, or Macbeth, later via Verdi's melodic intermediation. In the case of the sonnets production, the audience, while aware of Shakespeare's career as a poet beside his plays, may find it hard to ignore uh, its predominant knowledge of Shakespeare as a dramatist once his poetic works challenge the very essence of a vivid theatrical event. A prominent product and representative of rising Renaissance humanism, Shakespeare deploys his dramatic overs as pawns in the struggle to define Western culture's newborn site of human individualism. On the face of it, his foray into the sonnets was supposed to lead him further into the intimate core of individualism. However, the lack of the protective framework of narrative, com cementing and providing meaning to his negotiation with a vast universe devoid of the providence of a guiding God by the Aristotelian formula of a beginning, middle, and an end, exposed his fragile predom predicament even further to the vagaries uh, of the elements, time, or death, by which the circular cast of the sonnet's universe is surrounded and composed. Within the span of 154 14 lines measure of situations or reflection, focusing mainly on three uh, loosely epitomized human characters, destiny and decay become adverse digits in a word in which poetry alone enjoys successive continuity, endowing measuring endowing meaning uh, to the presence of human life. Thus, when Wilson chooses to, to apply his deconstructive practice to Shakespeare's sonnets, he propels their interchange with a meaning further than the protective bosom of enlightenment, led by the signification of the word. In a world where visual images have transcended the hello of avant-garde, to become an ephemeral phenomenon shared by everyone, where one's intuitive response to every sensation is an immediate urge to capture and transmit it by a camera, which has become almost an organic extension of our presence in the world of phenomenon. The return uh, of the sublime text to inhabit artistic practice uh, poses a new, invigorated challenge to the aesthetics of deconstructing human experience. The task of creating a histrionic sequence where privileged texts partake in the theatrical moment, not in the customary leading role, but as equal components of the visual and musical effects, without being in enveloped by the narrative structure, takes Wilson's non-interpretive work uh, with a theatrical text familiar from previous works to different realms, challenging both concepts of drama and sonnets alike. A more detailed analysis of the sonnets production than the limited span of uh, this paper allows may, shade, may shed a uh, new perspective on Wilson's challenge uh, to the traditional treatment of uh, text in the theater, and contrary uh, to many responses such as Trump or Netanyahu, in an appearance calling up a perpetual election campaign, passionately mumbling, insouciant, insouciant narratives and texts in front of a captive audience, as uh, impersonated by the Wilsonian vulgar figure of Eve, reiterating the ominous word 
view of Sonnet 66 between the stereotyped figures of the poet and the queen. This paper focuses on a major feature of Wilson's of uh, uh, Wilson's treatment of his textual uh, material, namely his insistence on deconstructing personalities by blurring the binar binarity of uh, essentialist gendered communities among the characters uh, delivering the text. This procedure serves as a complementary device to his deconstruction of the presence of narrative continuity in his reading of the sonnets as representing concepts and states of mind rather than essential uh, stories. Indeed, such an act must require a gendered statement as its transformational core, namely women actors playing men's parts and men's actors playing women's parts. This deployment has its bearing uh, on its uh, on the Elizabethan practice of uh, men playing women on stage. However, uh, once this exchange has been established, the direct implication of its undisguised practice is erasure of binarity rather than its uh, emphatic preservation as subservient to narrative as in the plays. While exaggerated moustaches or flaring Elizabethan style robed, robes uh, are used as means of gender transformation, the end result is establishing a diminished insistence uh, on typical gender properties without erasing the very concepts of manhood or womanhood. The identities qualifying the characters become functions of the intuitive sensation of the impact or abstract concepts such as love and hate, shadow and light, dream and wake. This blaring correspondence uh, cor uh, this blurring corresponds with much of the meaning advanced by Shakespeare's text, which accounts for the notable presence of Sonnet 20 in the theatrical texture of Wilson Wainwright's production. It inhabits a whole scene recited in German uh, by the hosting poet and sung in English by the androgynous figure, when, and then performed again by the cabaretist, ca cabaretist uh, and finally repeated during the curtain call by Wainwright himself. However, while in the sonnet the binarity uh, of uh, genders is still manifestly emphatic, not only in the stressed effacement of gendered individuality in the master-mistress figure of the addressed lover, but also in the association of women's, women's fashion with the shifting change, beside their gentle hearts, in the performative construction of the human figures as types rather than individual characters, the concept of a uh, narrative collapses uh, into performative abstract abstractions. As such, Sonnet 20, even though not located as the overture uh, of uh, Wilson's multifarious forays into the realm of abstract action, serves as an appropriate and charismatic milestone on its road to expunge the individuality of identities of the histrionic formation of Shakespeare's text, making most of blurring uh, the gendered borders of the lovers to foreground the abstract impact of love itself. Binarity in Wilson's uh, entire production uh, is transformed into conceptual abs abstraction, such as the two boy constructs, both embodied by similarly attired with Seurat-like uh, hairdo, female actresses, where one is rather mirthful and, uh, and romantic and the other rude and malevolent. It is the latter who serves as the third side of the triangle of the deliverers of Sonnet 20. The others are Shakespeare figures who encapsulated uh, in a remote window high uh, um, above at uh, the background, 
rendering him an external an entity, recites the sonnets in German and the androgynous character corresponding the depiction of beloved figure in the sonnet, who sings the text in the original to Wainwright's moving score, the instrumental accompaniment of which infiltrates the last verses of the poet's emotional recitation of the sonnet. All three, like all the other characters, have their faces painted white, blurring their individuality, and one uh, of the key words picked up by the boy, uh, the alter egg ego of the androgynous in the scene, uh, from the text to repeat emphatically is painted, which bears a special significance in the sonnet. In uh, the brief interim passage, before the androgynous figure starts singing, the malevolent boy uh, temptingly uh, reclined on a small bed injects some unknown stuff smilingly while the androgynous turns in a tempting gesture to the far above poet, dropping down his Elizabethan overcoat, the black furthers color of which he turns into a kind of a fan. In a visual pun on since she pricked thee, uh, the androgynous stoops to pick. Stephen Booth marks one of the double meanings of prick as select a shawl to be used, another visual pun provided by Wilson to Shakespeare's text here, for surprisingly terminate the scene by the sudden self-hanging of the androgynous, an ultimate act of blurring and effacement of the gendered subject by dying in its various meanings. The successive sequence of such tableau and reciting units originated in a series of dramatic monologues written by the Bard, advances uh, in Wilson's performance by uh, subverting, uh, sub by subserving the deconstructed words and phrases into a melange of <coughs> movements ranging from concrete ones as dropping sugar cubes, metonymic ones such as Ter uh, tearing of pages as signifying poetic rivalry to cryptic grimaces, yawns, weeping, or totally abstract actions, such as stabbing a child without a pronounced narrative reference. Sounds ranging from meaningful texts and melodic constructs to isolated cries, buzzes, animal laughter, animal laughter or roaring thunders and flooding of glittering lights. Wilson's motto for the whole sequence is the couplet ending sonnet 43, stressing the ambivalence of the day and night, light and darkness as partaking in, in uh, the complex uh, relation between, uh, I think it's, uh, it's going to, to end, conflict between the speaker and, uh, and his beloved figure. The text of Sonnet 43, thus dominating the entire exposition of the non-developing figures of the show until sudden, uh, the sudden burst of light commanded by the Queen enlarges the borders and theatrical playground within which the non-narrative action is about to take place, settled in their gendered blurred formation, uh, none but Shakespeare and the Queen Elizabeth bear similarly similarity to real life historical characters to whom a shade of narrative framework can be attached. However, even that hypothetical shade is not actually realized. The Shakespeare-like figure vir virtuously portrayed by a 87 years old female stage veteran bears no relation in its conduct or choice of delivered sonnet, even uh, whatever scant no, uh, to even uh, to whatever scant, uh, scant knowledge one has of the life of William Shakespeare, nor does the grotesque figure of the Queen brilliantly 
uh, rendered by an elderly male actor relate to any concrete episode in the life of Queen Elizabeth I, a fact that is humorously emphasized when the same actor surprisingly appears uh, in a figure mindful of Queen Elizabeth II, endowed by her blurred gendered attire, reciting one of the more episodic sonnets, Sonnet 143, in which the beloved woman is compared to a neglecting mother. Even though a visual resemblance is stressed both in the images uh, to the historical models, the tentatively implied suggestion that a queen is an abstract mental category when in spite of the visual affinity with the actual originals, the same actors may condense in himself the entire assembled feature uh, of the entity expressed by this uh, stage figure. Uh, when it suggests power and dominance, for instance, the widely delivers the she widely delivers the famous sonnet 18, while her alarmed subjects are peering at her uh, from one from the side, a frenzy which may correspond with her later delivery of sonnet 147, appeared by the outbursts of a wild laughter. All other characters for, uh, figuring on the stage, however, are an eclectic assemblage of archetypes and abstractions serving unindividuated situations. I skip uh, two paragraphs. The avoidance of a narrative is also reinforced by the fragmentation and lack of consistency of conduct of the various characters. Whereas characters such as the Queen, represented by an elderly women, woman actress who accompanies many scenes compassionately as an aside figure, winking to the, in, uh, the audience, uh, or the superimposed character of the comedian Georgette who addresses the audience directly in a cabaret manner, sustain a great measure of consistency through the entire show, other participants are fragmentary in the function and conduct. I'll skip to the last uh, paragraph of the... Uh, if one wishes to relate the impact of Wilson's work here to the current mood of the world morality, reality and its cultural reflection, one may speak to it in terms of the blurring and fragmentation of sensibility. Individuality of love and pain is fading in a world of inequality, busy counting the victims of aggression, poverty, famine, and neglect by masses, rather than promoting humanism and individuality. Is there a message of hope and concord at the end of Wilson's dialogue with the sonnets of one of the champions of humanist individualism? May it be invested in the rendering of Sonnet 87, memory of past dreams caught and released like unseen butterflies as the at the final scene, or the clinging to love as the only counterpart of injustice and death at the end of Sonnet 66, repeated by the finale, to time, the big rival of vitality in the sonnets, the answer is reserved. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, questions for Abraham Oz? So thank you, that was really interesting. I was sort of wondering about your use of uh, decision to um, emphasize the idea of deconstruction. As the, the? Deconstruction. Oh, the, yeah. Um, because the way that I saw the production actually was a little bit different. I mean, I do totally agree with you that when Wilson uses narrative texts, he usually deconstructs them. But I always have the feeling that he deconstructs these narrative texts in order to turn them into poetic works that are more or less ruled by a kind of a visual sonoric logic rather than by a narrative. 
um, logic. And I think that when he took the sonnets, in a way, he didn't really have to do much with, with them because they were works of poetry. And I sort of see the production as kind of like the extension of the logic that already appears in the sonnets themselves. I mean, you yourself refer to Sonnet 20, which I also that believe... Sorry? The, the, the Sonnet 20 that you refer to, I also believe it's really the interpretative key of the production and the decision to do the cross-gender uh, right. casting for the entire production, plus, of course, also references to Shakespeare's stage. Um, but I thought, for example, um, about the casting of Inga Keller, who played Shakespeare, uh, when she was close to 90. Um, obviously, like you said, we don't um, identify her with Shakespeare in a realistic manner, but we do identify her with Shakespeare in a poetic manner. And these kinds of changes and shifts, I think, achieve this kind of function in the end rather than simple deconstruction. I'll, I'll explain a little bit what I mean very shortly. Uh, <laughs> that I think Keller um, was not, on the one hand, she was not supposed to be a realistic representation of Shakespeare, but on the other hand, you could definitely immediately identify her as Shakespeare. You could recognize her as Shakespeare. So she was kind of like a stage representation of Shakespeare combined with the idea of Shakespeare's sonnets and the fact that they were 40, 400 years old by the time the production was shown. So this is kind of like my logic. Right. So, I mean, I don't see a question, but uh, what I'm saying is, is that, uh, first of all, I mean, I must say that uh, I don't think that what we do here is uh, claiming that uh, Wilson's uh, interpretation of the sonnets uh, necessarily was the one which actually I'm promoting here, uh, um, but that that is actually the end result of what we, uh, what we get when we see that uh, production, you know, and, uh, but uh, the cabaretist, uh, as you uh, mentioned, uh, is identifying you with, with, with this uh, 400 years uh, uh, thing, and I s spoke about the sublime coming back to, uh, in, into the um, deconstructed world of, of uh, Wilson, but I do believe that uh, the uh, well, this is a part of a very of, of a wide, uh, wider, much wider uh, reading of the of the work of Wilson on the sonnets. You know, particularly uh, relating to uh, many other things uh, rather than the blurring of genders. But uh, I believe that uh, it is a step. I'll do it uh, very superficially. A step taken by Shakespeare when he moves from the drama to the sonnets, taken much further by the modern uh, uh, by the modern uh, director who actually deconstructs uh, the work. And uh, I just didn't have time to uh, explain. Uh, this idea too much uh, in, in, in this very, you know, uh, scant uh, solution of uh, what you said. I think we have time for one more question. Perhaps. Um, this is for clarity, because I didn't have a chance to see that production when it was in New York. Um, are the sonnets performed in German or in English, or what languages are in p a play in the performance? It's it's performed basically in German, but there are actually uh, forays into the English, uh, into the original. Like, for instance, I mentioned in uh, Sonnet Twenty, it starts by the Shakespeare figures uh, recites the German uh, uh, rendition of the sonnet, but the Wainwright's uh, score, which is sung first by the Androgynites, and then it is repeated as a kind of an encore at uh, the curtain call by Wainwright himself, uh, uh, is in English. And then it's summed up by, by the uh, p poet in German in the few in the few last lines, and the boy who is, as I said, the 
alter ego of, of, uh, of the androgynous, picks up words uh, from the English, from the original, to uh, call them as kind of emphasizing those words as a kind of uh, stress. So you can't say that uh, there is any, uh, any conceptual uh, thing except for using the word in an equal, on an equal term with the music and the visual. Right. Thank you. Okay, our next presenter is Sasha Goldman, who is a Paris-based producer and filmmaker active in the field of arts and culture. A scholar of philosophy, he is a co-founder and secretary general of the Collegium International, a think tank network that has since 2002 been involving into an ethical, geopolitical, and scientific organization. And he will talk this afternoon about Wilson's home in art and on the stage. Well, thank you for organizing this conference and um, occasion to talk about is it working? and having occasion to take the floor with with um, the short presentation of life and work linked to Robert Wilson, which will take 20 minutes, but could take much, much more. Uh, in, in it was in depth of Texas that destiny crossed path of a young Robert Wilson, and without warning, a tectonic shift of artist creation was set in motion. A mayor, major and a multiple body of work has since been created more than uh, half a century later a body of work with a strong signature. The impact and origin originality of uh, the process were so powerful and unique that from the very first uh, moment of presentation of his work in France, which was in 71, Wilson's creation, uh, next day of his show, Tefman's Glance, were branded with the label Wilsonian and the most important critics in, on, in, in few occasions. He was 29, a young man coming from nowhere with the play and uh, that label Wilsonian went through from the very, very first moment, which is very significant for, late, for what happened later on. So there are many books and, and articles, analyzes, presentations, lots of it was done around his opus, preserving it for, his, uh, for, for posterity. Undoubtedly, with the pattern of time, when history takes its course, the legacy will take shape. We don't know yet what it will be, but uh, we are not there yet and far from it. A veil uh, seems to envelop the whole of Wilson's work and life. This something that resist comprehension of Wilson's life and work brings to mind uh, Heiner Müller's descriptions of Bertolt Brecht's uh, exile in Hollywood during the war. Scrutin he was scrutinized, scrutinized, and at every turn by uh, by uh, American Secret Services suspicious of his communism. Heiner Müller was saying. They knew what he does, what he hang out with, uh, what he wrote, uh, with whom he corresponded. His, uh, everything was uh, searched and his phone was taped. 
They knew everything about him. Absolutely everything, said Heiner, except who he was. The same way everything is known and said about uh, Robert Wilson, the artist and his work. And yet, in the face of this creative force, there is still some great gray areas that force us to question it continually. Unanswerable questioning that the artist himself ultimately seems to throw back at us will with, uh, at us while uh, facing it himself. How to deal with it? In his uh, interviews and conf conferences, Wilson likes to regulate, regularly come back to Baudelaire's, Baudelaire, thing, to point, quote, genius is nothing more, no less than childhood recovered at will. Uh, or in the past, in 74, there was a, in a program of a letter for Queen Victoria that uh, uh, Bert Hoffman did at La Rochelle Festival. We read uh, at a quotation, in the fear of entrusting the deepest part of our nature to language, we remember with anguish wha what is forgotten in the depth of time. All that remains in this inacceptable in, in need to remember, inescapable, sorry, inescapable need to remember. In this way, we advance along the path of dreams towards our lost being towards our primitive existence. It is a strange fact of life that the great artists closely linked to, that are very closely linked to the early years, a fact corroborated by a host of uh, observations. The subject seems obvious, but this shadow cast by childhood can be found bluntly, explicitly or not, in Wilson as in all the greats. My personal journey, journey with Wilson, his work following the stages of his life and uh, creations goes back for 53 years. Uh, we met in 71, 1971, a pivotal year for his work, a mere passage in his uh, destiny as an artist. Uh, it was a pioneering period triggered by the previous decade, the 60s, which culminated in a new creatively nurtured, which was creatively nurtured by New York artists exploring, by a great generation, New York artists exploring new modes of artistic expression. He was very much into it, and it's a context which must be strongly respected because for me at that time, Wilson for me was a, was a blueprint, him and all this art for US. And uh, it is absolutely impossible to consider him as a European director or American, European or American, French. He is more American than anybody else. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fact and I remember that period differently than it looks today. So it was 53 years ago. I was undertook uh, my first uh, filming. Uh, I was still uh, finishing my studies. And I was commissioned by Austrian television to cover a bit of one of the festivals of the pion this pioneering era uh, that saw the blossoming of new horizons in theater, dance, music, and all, all the arts in general. Those festivals were very phenomenal then. And they were, they were covered by productions coming from ma mainly, not from America, not from New York, from uh, Soho, from a uh, from couple of streets there. And there was an enormous num number of artists. Some of them we do remember, some of them they disappeared, but it was an incredible generating of, uh, of new creativity. It was one of festivals where 
all of them were very important for, for Bob. And uh, it was in line of, uh, there was Na Nancy Festival, Festival of Autumn in Paris, uh, Shiraz Festival, Spoleto, La Rochelle, all of the milestones in two or three years. And that, that must be understood because his work went up until the letter for Queen Victoria and then it changed radically. But that change was, uh, was uh, it's, it's, it's important to talk about it and we might have an occasion maybe on Wednesday. Uh, at that distant year, 71, uh, knowing nothing about Robert Wilson, I attended during that uh, filming, I attended his astonishing press conference at the festival. He was even not having anything there, he was just invited. And he was talking and it was like uh, an earthquake. It was unbelievable to have it and we can, uh, we can talk about it maybe on Wednesday because it's, uh, it, it, was, it was a key moment. One of the persons there were like 20 of them. There was, uh, I remember, a young student, Marina Abramovic, and she sang that that was a turn for her. She abandoned painting. Right, she was. Uh, she finished Beaux Arts, the, the painting uh, school, and all that. So, so I was completely captivated. But that uh, they called it press conference, or they called it. I don't know. It was. It was a happening. He did. I approached Bob and asked him for an interview for the reportage that I was doing. So we sit in the restaurant Wilson with the authority of his 28, 29 years, unrolled for hours his vision, his choices, his uh, just conceptions of creativity, his reflection on dance, theatrical expressions, and above all, the evocation of a town, some town lost in the heart of Texas, something. It was Waco his Waco and his Texas, his childhood and, and youth and in a, a, a puritanical and uh, racist town, as he was saying. He said in a disapproving tone, a town of flow and order, no theater, no museums or gallery, no opportunity for creative fulfillment, nothing. It sounded like a rejection. And yet reality turned out to be quite different differently tuned. His abundant narrative fascinated me, especially the intensity with which he unfolded the story of Waco, his history, his roots, his, his beginning, which was extremely rich in that pure poor time where there was nothing. But uh, it was, it was, uh, uh, it wasn't until a quarter of a century later that uh, Wilson created a sort of a performance, a solo called lecture, uh, which was in fact a monologue in controlled form recounting his thoughts on art, his life, including mainly Waco too, and his projects and what he would do and, and, uh, and what kind of things he would do for, for years and years later on. It was then that I realized that in our first meeting, I had witnessed the primo lecture, giving the rich and, uh, and um, disjointed account of his life and the story of an artist to be, the story of, um, of of the future that has to come through the ages. He was in an inspired and focused state, accompanying his talk by drawing with his Crayola in thousand colors on the paper, on the paper tablecloth, that it was, they had to change it twice. Uh, and uh, it, he did it in a, in a, in a very strange way, in reverse, in reverse, uh, in reverse, in reverse mode, upside down, 
for him towards me. So he was writing to me what I was supposed to read, an impossible uh, thing to do. And to make it simpler, he was changing the pen and the Crayolas with left hand, the right hand towards me. Um, it was, it was, uh, it went on for time, and I remember quite clearly what he was saying. But main, main parts of that are in, in his lecture, in his past, because what, what the subject is that he was repeating it all through, it, it for through fifty years, same thing coming back to it, and that was what was intriguing me. He never stopped repeating over the years. This constant fidelity of Robert Wilson to what he was, and therefore to what he is. This deep strata, the, the, the bearers of his future work uh, as an artist, were already entire, entirely constituted. It was there, baked by his uh, determin determination and it 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 made it made a frame of of what he became as a creator and regularly underlying his childhood for more than half a century i i was witnessing a repetition faithful to itself as if in a as if it was in a closed circuit it is a subject, however, that remains to be dealt with in depth in future exploration of uh, his work. Uh, well, it is quite long. I, um, I have uh, a very short, uh, um, very short piece of video to show to cover all this, it is, it is um, more interesting than reading it. The subject is that, which I'm jumping over here, but the thing is that uh, Wilson is in a way hidden in his solitude and uh, in his uh, in his generous attitude with, with, with uh, art creation and all that, there is something that uh, is too particular and uh, we can see that video takes three minutes. So I will just quote him maybe here in a very recent interview. Uh, he was saying, uh, my mother said to me, shortly before she died, she said, you're going to get along just fine in this world. That's a quote which was taken. Why do you say that, Wilson said? Because you know how to be alone. He's saying it in his very strong, dramatic way, with a tear which goes, but uh, to be alone means also to be in a state of inspiration and uh, his escape into permanent inspiration that he is uh, proving and living is, is something that I want to show because it takes three minutes, it's worth it. Those three minutes are cut out from, from a longer, how do I do that? Is it going automatically or? Okay, this is a, a rehearsal. I prove with this rehearsal that uh, the most intimate state is a state of inspiration. There are, a lot, there, there, there are lots of uh, things to say about it, but Wilson does not to be alone, to be alone and inspired. 
and that's 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 something and so it also shows his speed of uh, of producing he was commissioned to do um, uh, Oedipus Rex Oratorio by Cocteau. It is quite a simple thing. He didn't know how to access it, and he decided to do a silent prologue, and that's, that's a session which shows how it works. He sits down with his writer, his uh, assistants, and, uh, well, there's... Does it work? Okay, you know him, Holm Keller and uh, Giuseppe Frigeni, and uh, so Dramatis is saying, saying what it is. Wilson is not listening. Okay, so tie up that. Here's what it is. I'll tie that. And then I'll try, I'm going to try and help you. A little bit of There's a door. And there's two windows. And there's a car in front of the house. The door of the house opened. And a baby crawled out of the house. And a black horse drove by the house. A black horse. Watches the baby crawl, crawling. And the baby crawls up the horse, the black horse. And he rides away. So and that's editing, right? Writes. Writing down. And there's a youth that walks out of the house. And there's an old man that crosses the stage. Stage. As he gets off stage, he goes back to his house. He crosses the stage. Then the old man crosses again, and there's a black hole. And the door of the house revolves, and there's a man 
man got under the bed on the door of the house. The house was not this one. So this is this is a mix of him, his vision, and uh, immediately it was noted down. Immediately, in the cut, they did the first rehearsal, and that was it. And I have it here, storyboard, and uh, it, he did it in, in that period of time. So that's it. So first question, perhaps, Sasha, what, what is the title of the film? Sorry? The title of the film? The title? Do I have a title? The title is important and was not developed. Robert Wilson, Home, In Out, and On Stage. That's his escape. But I did not read uh, five pages more. I didn't time it. I didn't... You're very strict with timing, and it's perfect. I never saw but that. But unfortunately, like well the same rules apply Teamwork. to everyone presenting. OK. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, since we're going to publish a Robert know, no, no, Wilson yearbook, you can have yeah. the longer okay. version included that in that one. Thing, you know, I give you the paper. Yeah. Anyway. So questions? Um. Uh, where is, uh, this is a rather prosaic question, but uh, where is the uh, footage of the Stravinsky Oedipus Rex from uh, that was shown here? Where, where was what? This, uh, uh, the I did it. You did it? Yeah, now what's important for the footage is that uh, I put a camera there. Okay, the, it's edited, right? There are various things, but what is important is Bob, that you did not see in continuity because of cut, but he goes into a trance, and it is difficult to take it when, when it goes. I put the camera there, and I left it there. So he, he you know, it was just there and filming him, but he, he doesn't need to be warned that the camera is there. But that I, I did the footage. In 94. I think you're asking the perform. We see the actual stage performance. Did you film that as well? This the actual like with the set and everything. Did you film that too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's filmed in various periods. Yeah. Mm. It first. It first he he has his vision. Yeah. It's written down immediately after. Half hour later. They do a rehearsal by kids which are there. Yeah. And then you see, you see a rehearsal, then you see the theater that I filmed too. I think it was even uh, two, two years later, right? Uh, the, um, but it was packed, the and that's how he works. But you, said, uh, you said the letter for Queen, uh, to Queen Victoria w marked a shift for him, that his work changed. So do you know what changed and why did it change? What changed what? You said the letter for Queen Victoria. After Queen Victoria, everything changed. Everything changed. What did, what did change and why? Ask them how many times do you have to say that. <laughs> what what changed? Three more minutes. Three more minutes. It, it was, it was uh, Bob had three periods. First one is all the Waco, we already he created, and I know what he did and we might have occasion to talk about it. Second was uh, up to Queen of Victoria, and then third was after. But the change was more than radical. It was a change of personality, of person, of context. Main change is that he did Queen Victoria without a single, I was working on that, without a single profession. Absolutely, si no, nothing, no. His grandmother. 
And then after that, he did some of uh, little shows with Chris, uh, Christopher Knowles, nothing. And then Bomb came in with uh, Einstein on the beach, which is done only by professionals. So that's, that's but there is a lot to say. Um, in relation to what you just said, um, wouldn't the dollar value of man be, which happened in 1975 after Queen Victoria, wouldn't that mark the shift? Because that was right before um, Einstein. And uh, that was also without any professional actors. And I believe it was rehearsed uh, very quickly, I think either only three months or three weeks. Um, so uh, wouldn't that mark uh, where the uh, shift is as opposed to Queen Victoria? Well, a very good question. It's just not the form. It's very important to understand because the answer is that uh, Wilson did not have professionals because he couldn't, but uh, he didn't have that material and he did it in his own way. He was growing into what he became, but uh, uh, professionals he could have from the very first day. Uh, is that is that is that the answer? So, thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, well, the, the the change, just one line to the change, which is a little. His producer, who was holding him from uh, Daphne's glance until who brought in uh, um, possibility of doing uh, Einstein on the beach, she said to me once. Uh, using that uh, ironical expression, Monsieur, Monsieur, he has an agenda now. That's the difference. He had an agenda with dates and things, and he became a professional, but it did not harm any more. So that's it. Is that okay? Uh, more questions can be asked uh, after our panel uh, later. Yeah, so Queen Victoria, the letter uh, to Queen Victoria was the first production where you kind of use language. Yeah. And our next presenter will be Petra Egri, uh, who is an assistant professor and head of the Department of Applied Arts at the University of Petsch. Her research interests include performing arts, uh, fashion theory, and deconstruction. In 2023, her book on radical fashion performance was published by SZIF in Budapest and won the Book of the Year Award. And Petra Egri will talk about a post-dramatic theater of biography, The Life and Death of Marina Abramovic. Uh, in Europe, it's almost near to 11 o'clock, so I'm trying my best. <laughs> I'm particularly interested in the connection or difference uh, between uh, performing art and uh, theater play. So I think uh, Life and Death of Marina Ramovic is a good example for a blurring boundaries between these two. Uh, and I would like to start with a quotation from Marina Abramovic. I put this in my work very often, and I read a lot about dying. I think it's crucial to include this in your life, to think about this every single day. The idea of being permanent is so wrong. We have to understand that this can appear at any moment, and being ready is essential." End of quote. <laughs> and Biography is not a genre that typically ends up getting play out on the stage. What makes Robert Wilson's Life and Death of Marina Abramovic so special and unique is that it is not a simple, universal biography. 
In my lecture, I want to point out this and um, explaining the concept of uh, Jacques Derrida autobioheterotanatographic, and I claim that what Hans Dins Lehmann wrote in 1990s in his concept of post dramatic theater, Wilson actually already invented in the 1970s when he stated that theater has many other possibilities beyond filling with the words in a saturated one-dimensional literary structure. Um, Wilson has created his own canon of forms and the re reception of uh, his uh, theater plays involve the whole body of the recipient. His performance do not illustrate or explain anything, but rather offer a context to the audience. His work is intended to suspend the automatism of questioning the meaning. Robert Wilson's performance essays are characterized by a transgression of the traditional theatrical framework, the creation of illusion through spectacle, duration-based plays, and the disorientations of the spectator's gaze. Wilson is a persistent fighter against the logocentric theater. One is that reminds us to Jacques Derrida and his theater of cruelty and the closure of representations essay, who was reading um, um, uh, Antonin Arto. In his essay, the Western theater which seeks representation is only organized by the repetition of the voice of the authority and is always deprived of presence and identity. But Wilson's theater is closer to the theater of cruelty in an Artoian sense. It is characterized by the unreliance on presence and self-identity. Robert Wilson presented The Life and Death of Marina Abramovich in Manchester in 2011. In the play, not only Marina Abramovich's life, but also her death was staged. A death that did not and has not yet happened in a biological sense. Even more, the performance artist herself played roles herself and her mother too in this theater play, and she was present on the stage in a biographical Derridean sense. My lecture focuses on how logocentric meaning intensely and referentiality is disintegrated and how the autobiographical theater constructs the death drive narrative in a Freudian sense or in a Derridean term, develops it into an autobioheterotonatographic narrative. According to Derrida, there is an almost invisible line between the inside of the philosophem, for example, and the life of a nameable author. The biography inevitably extends to the death of the person that autobiography in principle cannot do. But life as biology and biography is not simply an opposition to death as thanatography and thanatologic. What prevents this direct opposition is precisely the objectification and its impossibility. Autobiography, if it is uh, exchanged into biography, may include death. Perhaps this Derridean idea and the problematic nature of the objectification of the performing art can be understood in Wilson's play, in which Abramovich's earlier performance pieces are incorporated into the theater play and most of Abramovich's performances are already clearly linked to the Freudian death drive. Just think about uh, the lips of Thomas or uh, cleaning the mirror uh, piece by Abramovich. The screenplay of the theater performance based on Abramovich's handwritten notes. Wilson received this. The stage story uh, also shares some affinities with the biography directed by uh, Charles Atlas and the biography remix created by the Belgian director, Michel Loeb. Marina Abramovich has appeared in both of these, not only in a biological sense, but also in a biographical sense. However, Wilson's approach differs in two very important aspects from the earlier elements of the biography series. Whereas Atlas and Loeb focus primarily on Abramovich's creative work, Wilson focuses mainly on Marina's childhood memories. Um, Wilson mobilizes distinctly uh, subjectivity, personal stories, rather than the story of the professional uh, performer. 
Wilson's production thus takes a more innovative approach to Abramovich's life. The other truly radical innovation is already in the production's title. The thematization of Marina's death and the staging of life events as seen though the land, through the lens of uh, uh, her own death. The gesture of how the production came into being was also unusual. According to the story of Marina, it was herself who approached the director with the idea of a staged biography. And I'm quoting uh, from uh, Abramovich. Every time I make a biography, I st uh, start with the same principle of I give up the control completely. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we know that it's not true. <laughs> when I hand the material over the director, he gets the opportunity to remix my life in a certain sense. It can follow the chronological order or not, it doesn't matter. I am material, nothing more. My life is a novelty for me every time. End of quotation from Marina. Wilson doesn't detail Abramovich's entire career at all, nor does he follow the chronology. We know why. Wilson's performance deliberately goes against the logocentric city. The structure of the script, which uh, divides the planned performance into a total of four large sections, is a good uh, indication of this very important reworking of the biography. It also divides the life to be presented into four major units, such as childhood, maturity, adulthood, and death. With these four, however, there is always a triad of uh, life stages. Wilson uses the rules of mathematical permutation to arrange the performance into almost random triple time units. This also helps to make the performance a fragmentary piece, in which, uh, again, we uh, found uh, the special Wilsonian uh, formal language. Wilson staging, due to Abramovich multiple presents, is autobiographical in uh, one of its defining layers. It seems, however, that in Wilson's performance, the autobiography understood as a performative material. The contradictions become the deepest essence of the production. Autobiography is never innocent. Uh, descriptive discourse, but behind its apparent referentiality and deconstructive subjective rearrangement lie. And I'm starting to quote uh, from uh, Paul de Man. Autobiography is a figuration of reading or of understanding that occurs to some degree in all texts. The autobiographical moment happened as an alignment between the two subjects involved in a, uh, the process of reading in which they uh, determine each other by mutual reflexive uh, subjections. The structure implies differentiation as well as uh, similarities. End of quotation. A uh, very similar uh, observation is made by Jacques Derrida in his Life Death Seminar. In this structure, a Derridian sense of difference is at work in which the author makes himself the object of understanding and the constant movement, a kind of constructive, distracting alignment. And separation takes place between the reader of the life and the author of the biography. In the theatrical performance, the application of this process, which is also active in a normal autobiography, takes place. At least two mirrored structures are in motion side by side in the play. Abramovich's writing and delivering of her own autobiography inevitably involved in confronting the subjective meaning of her life with its referential uh, fact. A further deconstructive mirror situation in the production arises from the fact that life and death of Marina Abramovich is not her own work. She is not the author of her own autobiography. She is not the director of the production. Robert Wilson is editing a life narrative from fragments of Abramovich's life story. But he was creating one that also speaks to the audience in an Abramovich's language. The autobiography, although it remains currently in the depth, 
in fact liquidate itself and become a biography. Um, one of the narrators of the performance is Willem Dufour, the actor who, as the narrator of our story, story, speaks in a rather cynical manner, wearing a white joker mask and military clothes. Uh, and that's the allegorical um, position of uh, the father. The mirror structure is deconstructed. There is no metaphorical reflection, but someone else speaks. The autobiographical discourse becomes metonymic. An autobiographical technique of Abramovich's inclusion of her own death in her life is particularly uh, contradictory. She imagines and plans her own funeral, which Wilson incorporates into the work, <laughs> pretending that Abramovich is dead. Abramovich herself takes place in this theater play, and the idea of the three marina is coming from uh, Marina Abramovich. Uh, we already know uh, this. Um, in the theater play, we can find three different coffins, um, and only one uh, contains the, the real body, uh, the real biological body of uh, Abramovich. With this opening scene, Wilson transformed the autobiography into epitaph. The epitaph is the personification of the dead person, according to Paul Demont, the inscription of his or her subjective sense on the material surface of the tombstone. The epitaph does not include any reference or deconstructive events. It only refers to the subjective sense. The opening stage scene functions just like as an epitaph, only it does so with the image rather than a text. In the autobiography, the real person is always and uh, disturbingly present, but in the case of epitaph, we never think of the real dead body, but rather of an idea. Prosopopeia means to give a mask or face, and it is with such mask. Uh, in the tri uh, triple coffins, uh, actually shown that the play itself begins. And at one point, Abramovich is removed uh, her mask uh, from her uh, face on the stage. Uh, there it indicates that the discourse of life that, uh, which is uh, also uh, true, also the true depth of Wilson's play, must occupy a certain space between Logos and Grammy, analogy and program as well as between the differing sense of program and uh, reproduction. And since life is on the line, the trait that relates the logical to the graphical must also be working between the biological and biographical, the thanatographical and the thanatological. In the case of Robert Wilson's piece, um, the discourse that follows up and links Abramovich's life and death, there is not a clear opposition between these two pairs, but rather a dynamic uh, reversal. And I'm uh, also quoting from Derrida. Uh, this borderline, I call it dynamsis because of its force, its power, as well as its uh, virtual and mobile potency, is neither active or passive, neither outside or inside, end of quotation. According to Derrida, an invisible line is drawn between the inner content of the work and the life of the author who can be named. And we cannot speak a simple pairs or uh, oppositions. But life as biology, according to uh, Derrida, and um, life as biography is not simply the opposition to death as a thanatographic and thanatologic, end of quotation. What prevents this direct opposition is precisely the objectification and its impossibility. A biography of a life is also always a biography of a death. Derrida's fundamental thesis is that autobiography is always a function of the objectivity of a name, of a signature, open to the primarily identity form in the absolute proximately of life and death. In this primary identity, in this regression, the specific self-constructive role of the mother and father operates, both in this uh, theater play. Abramovich's self-construction is surprisingly, thank you, uh, similar. And this is the theme song uh, of uh, Anthony Hegarty, Your Story, um, My Way. Uh, you can follow um, uh, the text in uh, here. Hegarty's curious monologue is uh, superimposed on Abramovich's life, on the writing of his life. 
The man eye, the white of the eye, which is not seeing but only some mirror, is a reflection of the pervert gaze that deconstructively formed the self. The gaze, however, is anamorphic. It whips, it cuts, it destroys and built. It shapes the body, it creates tears. At the same time, a deconstructive referentiality is at work in Hagarty's song, which also makes the storytelling perspective unstable. He tells a story from his own point of view by telling the story not of himself, but of you in the singular second person. He said your story in his own way, in the first uh, person or singular, such as in my way. And in doing so, um, he assumed the narrative. This eye through which the life story is told is also a man eye through which the women uh, story is told. And I would like to close my lecture with the doubts of Benoit Peters. Uh, he spent a lot of time uh, to write Derrida's, uh, Derrida's uh, biography. I'm convinced that there is no biography until after death. You can only make a portrait of a living person, which is something very different. The book I write will always miss the main reader, the one who died. It was this subject who became my subject, who became my subject, who was uh, positioned in front of me, who was as present as he was absent, particularly vulnerable, vulnerable to me. It can never answer me, and yet I wrote under his gaze as if I had to write in such a way that reading it would not make me blush. If there is an ethic of biography, this is it. End of quotation. And my question is the following about uh, this uh, really good uh, um, theater piece by Wilson. Can the theater play, The Life and Death of Marina Avramovic, be a biography of the performance artist born in 1946 who is uh, still alive? If she, as an actress, is present on the stage and the fragments of her life story are uh, composed of pieces of post-dramatic ironic montage into a Derridian thanatographical narrative? The answer is so simple. In Wilson's case, I think yes. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Questions for Petra? Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, you touched on something, and I was wondering if you could unpack it a little bit for me. You, you tied Wilson's work, particularly with this piece, in with Theater of Cruelty. And when I think Theater of Cruelty, I think of... Um, uh, like the living theater with Jack Gelber's The Connection, which, which had like a manifesto attached. I know that Wilson himself tries to be sort of manifesto free. C can you just unpack a little bit what makes this an example of theater of cruelty? If this work or any of his works, I'd, I'd love to hear it. The question is the connection between... Uh, between, Arteau? yeah, between this and theater of cruelty, the, uh, the Artaud theater of cruelty. Yeah. something very different. And the theater is cruelty is, um, in my view, is um, cruel um, for the viewer, for the viewer's body. And as uh, several um, uh, lectures uh, mentioned before, um, uh, Wilson's uh, plays are um, impact for the, uh, the eye, impact for, for the, whole, the whole body. I cannot explain uh, much more, but I think so. Uh, that is the main point, uh, in my view, uh, the connection between the theater of cruelty and the art, and also that um, in our art, so view, it's not, um, not not only the text is important. It's much more important the feelings uh, and the viewers. I think so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really fascinating. Um, I think also that this meeting between Abramovich and Wilson, this meeting of giants, is really interesting. And I, I really like the way that you locate that within Marina Abramovich's own agency of her own 
um, autobiographical representation, but I wonder how you see that, and, or in which way maybe you could see that performance connecting with Wilson's um, entire work, and especially his uh, recurrent um, obsession almost with the theme of death, and also the early works, which were also constructed around personalities like the life and times of Joseph Stalin, or Sigmund Freud, um, Einstein, these kinds of works. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, I think we can find a lot of references and remixing um, from uh, Marin Abramovich Uv, such as uh, The Lips of Thomas, and I, I can recognize uh, a, a lot uh, connections between uh, the, the um, um, Abramovich's Uv uh, in this uh, theater play, such as uh, uh, Cleaning the Mirror, uh, Lips of Thomas, um, yeah, there are several. Uh, what was the another? Ah, okay. In general, yeah. Yeah, as I mentioned, be, uh, no, I, I didn't mention. Um, in 2021, uh, I had a research project about Abramovich. And through Abramovich, I confronted with uh, this uh, really good uh, theater uh, piece. So uh, I'm not a professional uh, person, uh, not, nor a comparative, uh, I don't have a comparative view for the all uh, we as uh, I'm trying my best, <laughs> and uh, um, the comparative uh, view is uh, really important. I think so. Um, if you can mention uh, some aspects, I'm really curious about this. <laughs> okay. I guess. Um, I'm also not an expert in all of uh, Wilson's over, but I remember there was a documentary years ago, Absolute Wilson, and what dawned on me as I was listening to you and reading especially this, um, in his early works, especially when he went to Iran and they had like a seven day, that the, you know, the Bert Hoffman school is the actors who were with him who were almost like disciples to him, who really felt almost betrayed later on, at least in the documentary, when he went off to work with professional actors, but that they, some of them like nearly died making that piece. And this connects to, I think, the danger of Marina Bravo's work, where, yes, you can have a, a biography of her when she's still alive and on stage, because in so much of her work, there's always a real possibility that she will die on stage, you know, in the performance. And I think, thinking of his early work, some of that work was genuinely dangerous to the people doing it, and that's maybe part of what excited them to be in it. Thank you so much. <laughs> And perhaps a different way of answering your question is basically perhaps this piece was a biography of Marina Abramovic because she died when she gave up Atolian performance art for the sake of, you know, reiterating and theatricalizing her work, starting, of course, with, you know, the artist's present. I think 2011, 2012 at MoMA and then at, uh, at the Tate Museum in, in London. So in a certain way, you could read this through a Derrida lens, but in a different way, perhaps from what has been kind of suggested so far. Um, it's perhaps, the, you know, the uh, it's Abramovich becoming a theatrical performer and a subject slash object of theatrical performance that perhaps initiates her death and therefore makes her, you know, uh, an eligible subject basically for, for theatrical representation like this one. Thanks for this comment, I think so. And uh, I'm also dealing with uh, Marina's VR and NFT uh, era and it's, uh, I think that it's horrible. It's not performing art anymore, so yeah. That's true. Th thank you so much. <laughs> I don't know. Perhaps we have time for one or two more questions. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> okay, if not, I think we have to rearrange because we will have a panel now. Um,
So this is also our first panel discussion of this conference. Robert Wilson's post-dramatic stagings of classical and biographical sources. Um, so I think, you know, given all of your presentations, there are kind of a few keywords that have kind of popped up. Of course, I would like to address the notion of, you know, the post-dramatic, but of course we've also heard deconstruction uh, mentioned in quite a few talks, biography and autobiography, um, the notion perhaps of, of home, um, dreams, dream interpretation, kind of the unconscious. Um, but I would like to start perhaps with, yeah, I mean, post-traumatic theater, um, because what's interesting, of course, about uh, the presentations that we all heard this afternoon is that most of the material, except, of course, I have to say, uh, Marina Abramovic, just kind of, you know, biographical, autobiographical material, and, of course, uh, Shakespeare's sonnets, um, they, th this material might really kind of, uh, would traditionally be considered post-dramatic, but, of course, we also heard, you know, about Wilson's um, the productions of uh, canonical, classical, and, and modern plays. Um, I have to say that Hansis Lehmann, who wrote the book on post-dramatic theater himself, discusses Robert Wilson as a key figure of post-dramatic theater. And interestingly, he does not discuss Wilson's early non- or pre-dramatic productions uses uh, his Hamlet monologue actually as a key example for, for post-dramatic theater. So, so in that regard, even the, the theory of post-dramatic theater already very much includes the idea that you might approach, you know, uh, what is usually considered dramatical material from a kind of post-dramatic angle. Um, but that would be kind of a question how in, in terms of the, the different, you know, talks that we just heard, um, also if you kind of compare you, what you talked about to what you heard someone else, you know, talk about with regard to Robert Wilson's post-traumatic staging, um, what, what kind of commonalities uh, across these different productions kind of come to mind as far as post-traumatic theater is kind of concerned. I think that his ap approach to creating the work is certainly in the vein of, of post-traumatic, whether we're looking at it as early or as later. And this is a bird's eye view, right? Um, so I know there's a huge differentiation, as you discussed, between professional and non-professional actors. But just the, the, the approach we saw with his work on um, uh, Oedipus in, in, your, in, your, um, in your movie, that... Um, that seems to also be the approach that we heard about from When We Dead Awaken. That's the approach that I was reading about with the dream play. So that approach seems to be, to me, what calcifies him as a post-traumatic director. But certainly I would say that, you know, if we're talking about, in the largest terms, you know, is the text more important, right? So that even though there's a story there um, with the dream play, a story there with the Ibsen, a story there with the Black Rider, um, that it's still... Um, there's an approach to it that doesn't necessarily necessitate, like, I'm interpreting this text and beholden to this text, must do this text. Um, it's funny, I just came from a, a conference a few days ago, the Association for Theater and Higher Education in Playwriting Studies, and there's a big push with the Dramatists Guild, you might know this, for living playwrights to say, you cannot change a word of my <laughs> plays, and that includes the stage directions. <laughs> and you know, taken to an extreme, we get the same thing over and over again, if that's the case. And so coming to something like this, where there is a complete disregard, because, uh, and yet through his disregard, as I argued in my paper, through this post-traumatic process, if you will, he found the play, more so than, I mean, I would even say than Bergman's. I've only seen Bergman's TV movie. Um, but I, I, again, I, I, I've been questioning for myself, because often when I hear post-traumatic, I think, there's not a beginning, middle, and end of the story, but there is a story with what he does, but it's not, the spoken word part of it is just not the most important, it's the visual part, even when there is a spoken beginning, middle, and end, such as dream play. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I, would, I would say that, of course, post-dramatic theater doesn't mean that there is no engagement with the dramatic texts. Right. 
Those you know, but it's no longer the most hemispheres. important yeah. component. Yeah. So space, time, design components, uh, you know, uh, so, so all these other elements, if you look at the kind of Aristotelian kind of hierarchy of categories, which always kind of uh, put character and plot first, and, you know, design components last, it's, it's perhaps kind of, you know, a reverse ranking of these kind of components. That doesn't mean that there's no engagement with dramatic material, it's, but it's no longer the most foregrounded uh, component of, of these, I, I don't know, Aristotelian elements. Any, any other ideas about, yeah? Oh, repeat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I was. I thought the last paper was very thoughtful for me, because Marina Abramovich and Robert Wilson are two rare examples of the art that is in between visual arts and theater, per like performance art, becoming very famous and very well known with the huge difference of Robert Wilson doing it very early in his life and also early in the time of theater becoming abstract. He's definitely, like, I would definitely say that his major influence on theater with people like Peter Brook and uh, Pina Bausch was introducing the abstract to the world of theater. And Marina Abramovich doing her work, becoming very famous after these two th major shows in the museums very late in life. And the connection between them is very surprising in a way. And I thought of the post-dramatic, maybe the kind of engagement between performance art and theater, which always went in parallel, not meeting lines. And that's for now. Yeah, I mean, okay, I would say there's, of course, a strong parallel between, I mean, that's often kind of the question, you know, what separates post-dramatic theater from performance art. Obviously, there's, you know, the, it's, it's often a very kind of fine line. Um. Yeah, that's a good point, I think. Uh, but for me, what is uh, so problematic that how could you analyze performing art uh, through the lens, for example, Erika Fischer-Lichte? Um, it's much better for me, it's much better and much easier to catch um, the visual aesthetics of performing art through Hans D. Lehmann's concept. Uh, it's much more in, in my view, it's much more sophisticated uh, to compare with uh, uh, Erika fischer uh concept of uh, performing art. So that's true. I just want to add this. Um, and, and, and of course, you mentioned Erika fischer yeah, who yeah. starts her book on yeah. performativity yeah. by analyzing a performance by Marina Abramovich that she never saw live herself. But it's descri described in a way as if she was present at this you know, Swiss gallery performance in the mid-1970s, whereas in, in Lehmann's book, you know that every single performance that he's describing is also kind of observed. Uh, I think 
I don't have the answer, but I think th the, the way they meet or not meet and successful or unsuccessful that performing art or happenings designed by visual artists versus theater is exactly where we sort of try to investigate Wilson is whether or not they have a story or, or a plot or structure. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I would like to refer. Does it work? Yeah, I would like to refer to the definition of Wilson by Lehman. He said that he's scenographer, that uh, uh, choreographer uh, changed into scenographer. So uh, he's really the uh, artist of the scene, and not uh, artist of the text or anything like that. And, uh, and it would be very interesting to find out which are the most important components of this scenographer position. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, one I'm sure is that he separates the textual, the musical, the body, and uh, the images. And each has a separate and special uh, post-dramatic uh, coloring. So it's, uh, that's one thing. but. Also, uh, often says that said that it's a Gesamtkunstwerk, but it's very, very different from the Wagnerian Gesamtkunstwerk because the Wagnerian Gesamtkunstwerk, these all things come together. In case of Wilson, these all four things go their own way, different. It, it's more the Brechtian separation of elements, which was actually directed against Wagner's notion of the total artwork. Uh, but thinking of, I mean, because we were talking about Marina Abramovich and uh, Robert Wilson, but I think Robert Wilson is a singular artist. Um, so when we, earlier today, when um, Maria uh, Shevtova was asked about like teaching, you know, that she has exercises at the back of the book, um, I'm sure it's useful for someone to do exercises, but I can't imagine Robert Wilson wanting people to do work in his style, as far as like if they're not in his piece, because he is a singular artist, and presumably, especially with the Water Mill, Mill Cell Center, he wants artists to develop their own voices and not try to do a version of what he does. I can imagine that being quite deadly, of other people trying to copy what he does. And his post-dramatic theater is, you know, we have the visual elements, and I kind of spoke about uh, the creation of of one of the pieces, the piece that's missing there really is whatever is going on in his head, you know, which I loved in the video that you filmed, where we see, we, we can almost see the thinking happening and the anxiety and the inspiration when he's narrating what's gonna happen. Uh, but that's something almost secret in him. If we're talking about like the, also this morning, the, the spiritual, the spiritual, is, I think he said in the past, is like the making of the work. And you kind of see that in that moment in that video where you see his face and he's having some sort of experience as he's almost muttering to them <laughs> what should happen next. Um, so the post-dramatic, in his work, there's something, I would say, unknowable because it's locked inside him. Every artist, every great artist, um, there's something that is per deeply personal that theirs that you can't really explain. And the reason that his works work, if you believe that they work, is because they're unified by him being the one making them. It's less about, you know, we have the, we've taken the hierarchy of text, you know, visualists, and we've put them sideways, right? Like the, everything's equal. They are um, perhaps all equal or all separate and they're in engaged, but they're all being filtered through the lens of Robert Wilson. And that is what, and that's why when you look at, you know, the, the beautiful you know, stage pictures, like photos of his work, they sometimes feel a bit, you know, um, interchangeable, which may be a critique, but I think it's also because that is his handwriting. That is literally him. He's putting himself on stage. He's risking it. could have been a big mess. He could have put out these works and been laughed out of town, but instead he was vulnerable. He created this work, and I think um, what is inspiring about him, that he is, and as is Marina Abramovich, singular artists who are just committed to march to the beat of their own drum, and at some point in their lives, whether early in their life or late in their life, somebody really connected to their work and gave it a stage. But I think for, as an artist myself, I think what inspires me, whether I like a specific production or you know, performance art piece of either of those, those artists, is that they are 
um, rigorous and just willing to put their souls out there. And that inspires me as an artist to, um, to not be afraid or to try not to be afraid uh, to put my work out there and as whatever it is, you know, and not try to copy somebody else, but to do what I want to do. But, but, but I would say, isn't the singularity of worlds, isn't what's so interesting about the singularity exactly that you can always detect the signature style, even though the productions are the result of extensive collaboration, often with many trusted collaborators working in different fields, you know, I mean, where, where he, obviously he does not, I mean, particularly these days, he's not in charge of every single theatrical science system, but he works with people who he trusts, and uh, as a result, you see a production that's, that is still recognizably, you know, a Wilson production. I mean, it's kind of like, like Brecht, who always kind of collaborated on almost every single, you know, uh, play that he, that, he, that he wrote, often kind of involving three or four collaborators, but somehow it is still recognizably Brechtian, you know, and, and with, with Wilson, I think we see something similar. And I think also you could think like late Matisse. Very, Matisse is very old, right? And he's having these, or a lot of artists, I guess, these ar other artists helping him, you know, do the work. Uh, but it's his work. It's his vision. And it's, and I think that is like the lens is ultimately his. And that's what we're, we're hopefully seeing. And that's why I think it would work. If, if it weren't, I don't think the pieces would work. Yeah. Yeah. Wilson was um, preparing a play which was uh, an order for something very big, went down to the rehearsal place at uh, Watermill, and uh, he was blocked for two, three days. He didn't know how to start the thing that he had to do, so he went down. And there was a young, yes, could you get there was a young, young German student reading something and Bob lost. Yeah. He said, what are you reading? He said, oh, Dostoevsky, what is it? Oh, meek girl, what is it about? And then the, the voice said, it's about a man who was married to a very young girl and he went out and came back and there was a crowd in front of the building and she jumped through the window, committed a suicide. And he was upset saying, oh, if I would be back only five minutes earlier. And Bob looked and said, why don't we try that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not funny, it's very serious. <laughs> <laughs> why don't we try that? So he asked, um, I know whom, the three there, like a girl, a boy, and an actor, take off your shoes. Well, well, go there, and then start it and do it and try it and this and that. And two years later, I went to the theater to see Meek Girl, and what I saw is that boy and that woman, that was Charles, who was uh, very young still then, and uh, what's her name, Caballeros, the Greek dancer, and they played that man three different generations, and all was based on five minutes, five minutes early. <laughs> and that was a play, the best Dostoevsky ever, you know, there was nothing from Dostoevsky in there, but it was staged watermill, <laughs> the windows, you yeah. could hear the, 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 the play, et cetera, et cetera. And it was absolutely full of those non-verbal, you know, I don't know, is it post-dramatic or post-drama or post-nothing? It's absurd to talk about Wilson in those terms. I think it's it's something. It would be, be more. Would be that, yeah. that morning. That morning, yeah. he asked me to take Chris uh, uh, to to New York. So it was six o'clock in the morning by train. So I, Chris, how was it? Oh, Bob woke me up. I said, what happened? Oh, he woke me up to watch five o'clock, to watch a white deer coming out from the wood. Apparently there was a white deer and this and that. Meek girl started with a, with a, with a, with a big screen mm -hmm. and there was a big white deer in the front, nothing to do with Dostoevsky, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
What's post-traumatic about somebody who is a genius in creation? I don't know. There is a lot of it. And Heine Müller has a lot of written things about post-traumatic involvement. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. interesting for another. Uh, there would be another panel. Um, but I would like to come back to the question of deconstruction, because this kind of popped up as a theme in, in, in several uh, papers. Um, and, and just perhaps to respond to the first presentation on uh, uh, Oedipus, um, I felt like you know I, I was intrigued by kind of perhaps the Freud Lacanian reading, but I also felt like isn't this anti Oedipus? Isn't this kind of more Deleuze Gattari than I don't know Freud Lacan, Derrida, multiple Oedipuses, and kind of literally going against, completely against you know the. Uh, the narrative, the plot, the cohesion, uh, not just in the play, but of course also in the Freudian kind of complex. Yeah, I, I th I, you are true, yes. I don't know whether it's connected to Deleuze or not. Um, maybe not, but, yeah. but uh, uh, Wilson, probably uh, he, I don't know whether he knew Lacan or not. Uh, and that's not required. That he never <laughs> read <him>. Lacan, but <laughs> no. Still, the, that type of Oedipus that Lacan was visioning, so, and Lacan was closely connected to another group, which is very interesting to uh, understand Wilson, the surrealist. And often it's told that uh, uh, Wilson had a strong connection to Cezanne. Yes, that's one. But besides Cezanne, he was strongly connected with the surrealist tradition, mm -hmm. and Lacan was also good friend of the surrealist Breton and, and Dali. And what I feel in Wilson is that he's very Dali style. This Dali, uh, Dali had a, a book, uh, several papers on the paranoia criticism, uh, which says that you project from yourself a world that becomes an objective world. Uh, a paranoiac works like that. He thinks that somebody is listening to him and uh, controlling him and nobody is there, but uh, through his, his paranoid uh, imagination, he creates an objective uh, strategy uh, situation outside in the world. And I, I think that uh, Dal uh, Wilson's images are very similar to the Dalian images, this uh, paranoia critical images. So it would be interesting to do go back to this surrealist tradition besides the Cezanne. Cezanne is structural. These are not structural. However, Dali liked Cezanne very much, so it's, uh, he wrote about it. So that's, that's, I think, a task of those who work on, on, on uh, Wilson. How find out how the image world is created in his world. And another thing I thought of what would happen if from tomorrow it was uh, it is said to the theaters that from now on you must play like Wilson. <laughs> Would it be possible? <laughs> Probably not, because it's very special. But still, it's a great thing. So it's a but I mean, of course, you, you know, I mean, since this just came up in terms of theory, I mean, of course, you know, now, I mean, we, we analyze artists' uh, works with regard to various theories. And it's, you know, uh, uh, we read, you know, artistic pract practices with regard to theories, but it doesn't mean that the artists themselves, you know, did applied theory, yeah? But, but, but we kind of try to uh, detect kind of patterns, you know, with regard to kind of theories that we're kind of familiar with, but that doesn't mean that that's kind of intentionally kind of inserted in the work by the artist by artists themselves. I think that's always kind of important for kind of academic discussions like this. Um, but I want to come back to, to, to deconstruction. I mean, you know, like you also kind of use the term with regard to uh, Wilson's production at the Berliner Ensemble, you know, the Shakespeare and sonnets, and again, you know, with regard to Marina Abramovic. Um, Well, I feel like uh, the old person out because we all talk about post-traumatic uh, theater, whereas the theme that we did in the paper was basically to take a non-dramatic uh, text of a dramatist and then uh, 
and deconstruct it in, in, in a sense uh, that uh, the only constructive way of using the sonnets on stage is turn it in, into a drama and then deconstruct this, uh, this kind of drama. Uh, so I must say that I mean, I'm, I'm still uh, questioning myself uh, whether what we imply as his interpretation of the sonnets can be actually applied to anything else like that he, he projects from himself because what is it that he is projecting into this particular? Uh, so I think this is a, for me at least as far as I know, other works that, uh, that uh, Wilson did with also with Shakespeare, it's a kind of a unique case where you, <laughs> you take the words which are basically the, the one element uh, important for the sonnets and uses, use it as a kind of an equal uh, factor like the visual uh, or and, and the musical. So what is it that you deconstruct actually? So uh, it's, it's still a, it's something that I, I should fathom. I mean, I'm trying to work and understand on it. And as far as I'm concerned, whatever I do in this paper and in the wider uh, work which it's part of is trying to, in, to impose some kind of, uh, of an idea of myself, of what he's trying to do without ever knowing uh, to what I can connect it in his, in his work. Perhaps I'll find it. So I actually had a follow-up question to the title of your talk. You know, I mean, gendered and non and ungendered communities, because there's one aspect really uh, that we're not addressing within the context of, of this entire conference, and that is basically the queer Robert Wilson, because the, uh, the, his sonnets, I mean, his production of the sonnets in particular strike me yeah. really kind of as queer theater, um, and, and highly theatrical, post-dramatic, but there is such a strong, I mean, it's, it's interesting to me that, 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 that few of his productions are ever really kind of read that way, but that is a, a production that is so overtly queer in its kind of choices, um, but it's usually not kind of contextualized like that. What, could you say a few it's more words about this? It's not contextualized like that, but on the other hand, uh, I don't, at least I didn't yet find any uh, reasonable uh, way to connect this queer uh, theater, which absolutely it is, of course, uh, 127 of the sonnets are particularly addressed to another, another man. Uh, but in what way does he use this in, in, in terms, for instance, for choosing and selecting the, the sonnet that he does, you know, because he, he selects 25 sonnets uh, from different parts of the 154 sonnets, and there's no, at least in the choice of sonnets, uh, there's no way to know what is it that he's trying to uh, to make so uh, in this respect I mean it is definitely a queer theater but which actually resists every kind of for me of queer theory that I know right. okay. uh, I just have a thought though because the the music is by Rufus Wainwright and I remember in the 90s um, a friend of mine had a poster of Rufus Wainwright where it said Ruf Rufus Wainwright, the gay messiah, <laughs> and you know, just something. I think that part of the text, perhaps, but the other part of the the audio book is Rufus Wainwright, 
And I don't think that's something, that's something he presents very much in his music and in, in his um, public persona. And um, so I, I think it'd be as simple as that. The other thing that, that I'm thinking about, I'm not sure if this is useful to you, I attended a lecture um, a few days ago um, given by a woman. She identified herself as a trans woman. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about the, the young men in Shakespeare's productions. And she was using a hypothesis that perhaps they, we, we did not have the terminology then, but were, we could think of them as, um, early, uh, as early trans folks. Um, that perhaps that in those embodied moments when they were um, playing the women's roles, that they were playing something true to themselves that they could not perform publicly. Now what historical documentation I do not know, but, I, but it was a, I th thought maybe there's something there already that speaks to, you know, the, um, maybe not the choice of the sonnets, but just the choice to do the sonnets the way that he, the way that he did. Well, uh, there's, again, you, you mentioned historical evidence, and we are, we are not sure yet right. whether these uh, young men who played the women's part, whether they were in their uh, 13, 14 uh, years old, or 17, 18, uh, there are different theories about those. So we, and there's a main, major difference if we look at them as the older and the elder ones, you know, which will be easier to 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 interpret in terms of queer queer theory, you know, so uh, it's it's still a, a, a great question mark which uh, should be fathoms, and uh, I don't pretend that I I have the answers as yet, but it's a very interesting riddle at least. No, thank you. So, so Petra, I have a question also kind of coming back to deconstruction. You referenced Paul Deman and, and Derrida. Um, so how would you apply this, this concept that you applied to, uh, you know, the Ma Marina Abramovich piece to the earlier uh, pieces on Freud and Stalin? I mean... Deconstruction is always about close reading. And I think... Um, if we are trying to analyze Wilson's play, uh, we can, the, the only, for me, the only one way to understand Wilson is deconstruction, like in the close reading of this uh, play. Um, the, also the close reading of the visual dramaturgy. It's not just about text. Deconstruction is not just about text. You can analyze through the deconstruction the visual dramaturgy. So, yeah. I, in my view, that's the answer for this question. <laughs> In briefly. <laughs> so if that's okay with everyone on the panel, I would actually like to open it up to, to the audience. If uh, audience members have uh, questions to any of us here on the panel. Hi, thank you for this day. I want to first share that this is a question that I'm now asking myself. Um, I'm, un I'm drawn to the fact that this panel is called post-dramatic stagings. So, so it's the verb and it's, um, and I understand how we're looking at Wilson in that way, but as was also brought up, uh, Wilson is an American artist, right? So um, thinking about Bonnie Marinka and Theater of Images, or thinking about Eleanor Fuchs and Death of Character, there are other ways in which we could be addressing Wilson's work. And so I'm interested in uh, the Eurocentric framing of Wilson versus the American, if there is one, you know, like just thinking about the different ways in which we think about, contextualize, and write about an artist. So Sasha, since you already addressed this earlier, would you kind of <laughs> perhaps respond in more detail? You know, the, the perception of Wilson on one hand as American, Euro-American, almost kind of an assimilated European. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. so what I saw uh, Wilson in Norway, I was seeing, um, so it was Lady from the Sea adapted by Susan Sontag um, in Polish in Norway, okay? 
So all those layers are what stood out, what I remember most with both like Alita being kind of a mermaid, like there's mermaid-esque you know, quality to um, the Lady from the Sea, uh, to this idea, um, but also the, the neat plays were really what stood out. I think, I, you know, I think that came across also in the, tro the choice of what I focused on um, with When We Dead Awaken, and that is incredibly American, uh, both style and choice to put that in, because I could see in a, a European, you know, a European director choosing, they would kind of just go with this heavy seriousness throughout uh, and experimentalism, and, and but he puts in these neat plays, which you know both comment and highlight what he's interested in the plays in an incredibly entertaining, joyous, you know, really harkens back to vaudeville, to like American musical theater, which is, people say is a one American, you know, authentically American art form. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's where I see, that's where I see his Americanness like the most, and that he's um, commenting on whatever the story is through, through, those neat, through those neat plays. And they're not necessarily what, if you think of when we did awaken, do you think, oh, this is a story about love? Is that you know, it is, you know, very much so. People say, oh, it's about an artist, and they're. But I think in those neat places, actually showing us that it's also this, you know, this focus on on the different types of love and the problems of love uh, in a complex and entertaining way. Um, and I think what you're saying, uh, both that you know, Lady from the was Susan Sontag's um, version of it. Um, that you're choose that you focus on, you know, Ele Eleanor Fuchs, uh, uh, Bonnie Marenka, like women. I think we're not also ignoring like all the world of all these men and these ma male theories, uh, but there is a very American and potentially uh, more female views to to be looking at at his work um, as well. And the fact that he was, you know, he did collaborate with Susan Sontag on that specific production. And again, I was watching it in Polish with Norwegian super, super title, so I was more watching it from the perspective of a of, of visual theater, of knowing the play, and then, so I, I, only afterwards I think that I look at the adaptation, but it's, it's been years, so I don't, I can't speak to that. But the fact that he did collaborate with a really notable American woman <laughs> to create this production about a woman, you know, is, is telling. And to, resp to respond to your question differently, of us eight people sitting here, only two are American. All three organizers of this conference are European. And one of the uh, participants in this conference, uh, and Catania, for example, you know, in her book on dramaturgy, when she comments on Hamlet Machine, you know, she, she describes what she perceives to be this European misconception of Wilson as this, uh, you know, American savage in a certain way. Yeah. So, so the appeal is that you know Wilson is kind of exotic for European uh, theater audiences because he is really exoticized in a way. In a way, you know, and, and in a certain way, it overlooks. Uh, basically, uh, the fact that he's very well organized and, and knows very well what he's kind of doing, but there's this, you know, cultural othering in a certain way that that has always kind of made him attractive to European theater producers. And there's also camp, you know, his if you're talking about queer aesthetic. I'm thinking right now specifically of a moment in The Black Rider, which sums it up for me, where uh, the song "He's Not Willem." where Pegleg is singing, you know, I would go anywhere with you, and she's doing the exaggerated remote. I mean, it, it's camp. It, it, and, um, and I don't know the whole history of camp, but I, I know that it came out of um, uh, certainly um, uh, safe spaces, uh, drag spaces, we're looking at cafes, et cetera, uh, uh, in, in the US leading up to stuff like the performances of Cafe Chino in the 1960s. I mean, so there's another, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not at liberty to say entirely American, but mostly American. Uh, and, and of course, yeah. one of the key figures that Susan Sontag associates with camp is uh, Jack Smith, Flaming Creatures. And of course, Jack Smith was a performer in some of uh, Bob's early productions. Right. Uh, in, in connection with this American European, I think that we have to separate the sociological, yeah. sociological definition. America didn't want to accept uh, Wilson for a long time. 
uh, Europeans accepted, remember Aragon's letter to the five years before dead André Breton. Mm -hmm. uh, a fantastic uh, text uh, um, put Bildon into the surrealist movement, in a sense. But also uh, others in Europe hailed and, and liked and loved Wilson much better than in America. So it's a sociological, whether his work is American or European, it's very hard to say. I remember in his Absolute Wilson uh, documentary film, he talked about his first play when he uh, had children with a uh, shaving uh, foam box and at a certain moment they had to push the shaving box and it came out and that was the theater. And immediately the mothers of these children came up to the uh, stage and took the children <laughs> with them because it is, it, is, it is not good. And the father was very serious and said that this is, this is a mad thing what you do. So it's, uh, it was in Waco in, in America. So, um, it's not I don't know whether it was American <laughs> at all. <laughs> also so Waco. Whether we can <laughs> say that it's American. I just um, yeah. want to not push back, but the idea that you know the Europe accepted him. I don't think any American artist is accepted. There's no funding, so the idea that any American artist is accepted, as far you know, if they're doing whatever avant-garde work, that they're going to suddenly get, even in the '60s, that they're going to get tons of money and support. Um, that's just not. I don't think that's actually a, th a thing, and that those who've succeeded in finding funding in Europe, you know, and that's why they're able to do the work that they're able to do. That's why they have to base themselves, or have had to base themselves often in Europe, because that's where, like, the government does fund the arts. We're here overwhelmingly. It's like, it used to be like the amount of a postage stamp is what each American, you know, is, is giving for the NEA, like the, that's a tiny amount of money and that's considered too much money to be giving to the arts in this country. I have to say as organizers, we even have this discussion about the future of Watermill and the, the, the new to be inaugurated uh, Robert Wilson archive. If this, for example, were a European or German institution, you know, like the Bertolt, uh, Bertolt Brecht archive in Berlin is completely financed by the government. It's part of the Academy of Arts in Berlin. You know, but, but that's, of course, kind of unthinkable in the United States. There need to be other funding sources, endowments, et cetera, to kind of, you know, to, to secure the continuing kind of existence of an institution like this. I think we have uh, time for one more question. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Do you want to go first? I have just a quick question. Then you can go up. Okay. Um, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't really have a question, it's just a comment, so then we'll leave the time for his answer. Um, just an observation, uh, hearing all the uh, lectures and kind of like running the idea of post-traumatic theater in my mind. So I think Clayman uh, described post-traumatic theater both as a theater that doesn't subjugate all elements to the text, but also as a theater that doesn't represent or try to represent the world anymore. And I think that this part of the definition is actually very relevant to Wilson, and that's something that has stayed pretty constant in his work through the years, and that's related to what you said also regarding this very identified Wilsonian style, which is also always a non-representative style because he always creates his own world no matter what the texts are. And I think with regards to the idea of subjugating the other elements to the text, it's a little bit more mm, difficult to describe, especially in later Wilson. It's not like post-dramatic is like a yes or no question. There's kind of like a continuum. Thank you. Uh, so the question I want to ask uh, is in relation to the uh, whole thing with the exercises and how it um, be disastrous if anyone tried to imitate Wilson because it's so much um, part of uh, himself and how it just can't be imitated. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, about the possibility of revivals because, um, event um, because eventually Robert Wilson won't be around to reproduce his work. And uh, at that point, uh, will it be that no one will ever see a Robert Wilson production again because it's just so singularly part of him that uh, no one could see it again? Bec I know when he uh, uh, donated the uh, tapes to the Theorem Film and Tape Archive, he does say if someone wanted to recreate Einstein on the Beach 100 years from now, they could. But would it ever be successful? Would it ever, tru would it ever truly um, still have any impact 
of the kind uh, that um, everyone had when they first saw it in 1976, would um, is, it is it even possible to consider such a pr um, idea? I think that uh, it, it wouldn't be produced again, but its uh, ideas, its direction, its uh, new uh, aspects can come back into the later papers. Antonin Artur came to my mind, whose uh, theatrical career wasn't really successful, <laughs> and uh, but still the Artur uh, techniques and ex expectations are present in the best postmodern theater projects. And other folks have produced um, Black Rider and his Wojtsek, but they don't do his style. You know, they do something else with it. I know there was an Einstein the Beach I'm so sorry, I think it was in China or was announced in China that it was going to do something completely, completely different. Well, I apologize. I don't think it will be exactly the same, but the way uh, Robert Wilson is notating his staging, I know he did with my students um, one, one scene of Hamlet Machine, and so I got from his archive exactly the notation. So every little finger his thing is noted. But I think it will not be the same. I have seen Pina Bausch, for instance, and she imitated exactly the production of the original production of Pina Bausch. It's not Pina Bausch anymore. And I think the same thing will be with Wilson. You know, you can have the, the same kind of gestures, but it will not be Robert Wilson. But isn't it true for any art that the time we see it is different? I mean, I also saw Pina Bausch again after her death. And, but it wouldn't have mattered if she was alive. I would have seen it different in the 30 years that had passed. It's not the same. Of course, nothing could compare to the impact Einstein on the beach had when it premiered. But I think it could be reproduced and we'll never know until it's done yes. how successful it will be. But it could be interesting, like so many schools are now doing the triadic ballet. And it could be interesting, it could, it but could it could be different. Yeah, it will definitely be different. Sure, I don't say it's not interesting, but it's not anymore Bob Wilson, like it, it's not anymore Pina Bausch. I have seen <laughs> <laughs> nearly <laughs> all his products before, and I have seen several afterwards. And it's still interesting, <laughs> but it's not Pina Bausch. On this note, let's conclude. Oh, yes, okay, one more. Yeah, 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 respond, respond. <laughs> well, there are two things. First one is that to do a remake of the play, even the artists, I, I have plenty of examples in my head, who did a re redoing their own big thing. One is I don't know if you remember him. Pip Simmons did an incredible play called Do It. And he read it for Avignon Festival 15 years ago. I saw the first one, and the second one was the same people, and it was a disaster. Now, <coughs> talking about Einstein on the beach, I saw the first one, I saw the remake, tw two remakes. Uh, I, have a, I, have a, I have an interview done with Phil Glass who said, uh, Oh, there is a big difference. Before we were a fringe piece of something new. Today we are a mainstream. <laughs> and I saw two different Einstein on the beach. It is not a question. The question is the legacy. The question is what will stay after years after Wilson of what he did for theater? Uh, and more than for theater. I wonder, I know what stays after famous, 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 biggest directors who disappeared only 10 years ago. There is nothing, nothing left. Blanchon, uh, Chéreau. Chéreau did a feature film, so, but theater. Uh, how about Peter Brook? What is going to stay after Peter Brook? I can tell you nothing. So that's, that's, but Wilson is a revolutionary. Uh, he's not a theater director. He's, uh, he, it's something else. And that's a secret. That's a magic. 
And you're absolutely right. I mean, his, his influence by, by surrealistics is, is it's the key for, for all his work, yeah. which is to break what there is. I remember he did a portrait of a uh, photo of uh, a big, big Polaroid that he did of, uh, of an actor. It did not work. It did not work. It, bring that red camel. It was a written red camel. He put it on the head. And he said, you always have something to break it. And that's, that's the thing. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the key. But uh, it can go on and on and on. It's like, I don't understand what it means post-traumatic. I would like to thank all panelists for this great afternoon, all of your individual presentations and then this panel discussion. We will now have a one hour break and at 7 p.m., not in this space, but the other uh, theater, um, Frank will have a conversation with Robert Wilson. Thank you. <laughs>